Hello, sons and daughters. Today, old Tex will take you all on a journey through the darkest corners of these here backwoods. I'll be sharing stories of these supernatural creepy critters and bone-chilling true horror stories. Y'all best buckle up, cause things are about to get downright spooky. So my girlfriend and I spent two years driving around the United States and Canada. We're both Australian. Our rule was pretty much find somewhere cool to stop, pull over, relax, and enjoy the nature and the freedom of our travel. We never really had any bad times during this whole experience, except this one time. So we are staying at this little rest area on the coastal border between Oregon and Washington. It was beautiful right beside the ocean, sea otters on the rocks, cool sea breeze blowing through our van windows and the sound of chill water lapping against the rocky shore. Very peaceful. We went back into town after the sun had set to grab a pizza or something and returned to a now empty car park. Whatever. We are used to this, not a problem. We were just hanging out, watching shows on my computer and listening to the chill nothingness outside. It gets to about 10 p.m. and I decide to call it a night. As I am falling asleep, my girlfriend looks out the window and now notices a red ute pickup truck at the furthest end of the car park, like 50 meters away. There's a ute down there, she says. I acknowledge this, but don't really care, ha-ha. It drives away after sitting there for around 10 minutes. Five minutes later, it returns, but a couple of park spots closer. That cars is back now, I'm in the edge of sleep, eyes closed, brain now switching off the last switches of awake them. All I can muster is a grunt, ten minutes pass. Car leaves, car comes back, this time closer again. My girlfriend now wakes me up and explains what is happening. I look through our windows to see a very beaten up red ute canopy on the back with completely blacked out windows. Now I'm feeling a little weird. I watch the car sit there, completely still and silent for another ten minutes before it drives away, only to return once again. Moments later, it is now maybe two car spaces away. We are watching this car, presumably watching us. It is about 11, 11.30 on a Wednesday night in a semi-lit car park in a foreign town in a foreign country. Being Australians, this dude probably has a gun exchanges back and forth between my girlfriend and I. This guy had parked so close that as soon as his door would open, he would more or less be at our van before we could even get out of our bed, which is built in the back of the van. Fifth this. I get out of my bed and crawl to the driver's seat all while staring at his blacked out, almost driverless windows, get to the driver's seat and got the F out of there, zoomed across the bridge and slept in the car park of a Fred Meyer. Just the fact that the fella kept parking closer and closer in an otherwise vacant car park, F man. I took a deep breath as I stood at the entrance of the newly discovered cave system. As a park ranger, I was no stranger to adventure, but this mission felt different. Our team, composed of fellow rangers and a group of experienced spelunkers, was tasked with exploring and mapping the extensive caverns beneath the national park. As we descended into the darkness, the air grew cooler and more oppressive. Our headlamps cast eerie shadows on the cave walls, revealing breathtaking stalactite formations that had taken millennia to form. The spelunkers led the way, expertly navigating the treacherous passages and guiding us deeper into the heart of the cave system. As we ventured further, we stumbled upon something none of us could have anticipated a horrifying, previously unknown species of crawlers that had evolved in the darkness. These creatures were unlike anything we had ever encountered with pale, translucent skin, elongated limbs, and razor-sharp teeth. They were territorial and aggressive, stopping at nothing to protect their subterranean habitat from the intruders who dared to enter. With each passing moment, 
Our situation grew more desperate as the crawlers closed in on us. We were forced to rely on our training and instincts to navigate the treacherous caverns, doing our best to evade the vicious creatures that hunted us. Time was running out, and we knew we had to find a way to escape this subterranean nightmare before it was too late. Through sheer determination and a stroke of luck, we managed to find a narrow passageway that led back to the surface. As we scrambled out of the cave, our hearts pounding with relief, we were met by two men dressed in black suits, their expressions stern and unyielding. You must keep silent about what you've seen down there, one of the men warned, his voice cold and commanding. Those creatures are government property, and we cannot allow their existence to become public knowledge. The weight of their words settled heavily upon us, but we knew we had no choice but to comply. This happened about 16 years ago, and I still don't know how to wrap my head around it. So, my right friend and I were sitting on my brother's bed watching TV, just chatting and hanging out. My brother had a box of metal by pellets on the bed. We didn't bother moving because he had his stuff everywhere. While we were hanging out, my big German shepherd, Guinness, came running into the room playfully and jumped up onto the bed causing the box of bee pellets to flip over and scatter everywhere. I still remember the sound of them hitting the hardwood floor. However, as this was happening, it was as though time reversed, literally rewound, and my dog ended up back on the floor as if he jumped down backwards, and all the baby pellets reversed back into the box. Even Guinness had a look of confusion on his face, and he ran out of the room. When we looked down, there were absolutely no pellets on the ground, and the box was closed and secure on the bed. My friend also remembers this in vivid detail. Otherwise, I would probably convince myself it was a weird dream, but we both experienced it and re remember it all these years later. I haven't spoken about these events to anyone since they've happened to me over a decade ago, honestly closer to 15 years. I am now a 30-year-old man, and what I experienced in Red Ash, Carryville, Tennessee, happened to me when I was about 15 or 16 years old. Red Ash is a small area off Interstate 75 running through Campbell County, Tennessee, the county where I was born and raised and still reside in now. Red Ash was established over a hundred years ago as a little mining province, but is now defined as the land between Red Ash Cemetery and Red Ash Baptist Church off of old Tennessee Highway 60. Free and if you go googling it, you'll see that it has a reputation of arguably being one of the most haunted places in Tennessee from ghosts of miners, goatmen, and even murdered witches. If you read long and deep enough, you'll see there's lots of strange happenings around this area. But I'm not here to tell you I saw a seven-foot-tall man with the head of a goat and hooven feet standing at the base of a train track, tussle. But what I saw I still to this day can't explain. About 15 years ago, a few friends and I, one guy who was a couple years older than myself and two lady friends of ours, were driving around one Saturday night looking to find something to get into in our small, quiet town. So naturally, of course, we came to the conclusion to do what all the teenage kids do that grow up in our county. We decided to go to Red Ash and test some of the legends, and boy, are there are a lot of them. But those are stories for a different page. This one isn't about urban legends. This is about what I actually saw. We went to a set of train tracks that if you park on and turn your vehicle off that, somehow the car will start to rock and gently roll off the tracks. That didn't work for us. So we decided to head up the road to the cemetery to tell ghost stories. On the ride to the cemetery, one of the girls with us said her grandpa had told her on one of the unnamed dirt roads in Red Ash is an old abandoned graveyard where a lady was murdered and buried almost 200 years ago for supposedly being a witch. 
We thought what the hell and decided to go looking for this graveyard to see if we could find the unmarked grave. We turned down one dirt road barely wide enough for my friend's small car and drove down it for a few minutes, when all of a sudden we're hit with blue lights behind us. And when I say all of a sudden, I mean it. Now, mind you, it was around midnight and pretty dark out, but we didn't see headlights or anything trailing behind us. Just a burst of blue police lights. My friend pulls off the road as much as possible, and the cop pulls behind us and gets out of his cruiser and walks to the door. My friend already has his window down. It's late July and 80 degrees at night with no air conditioner in his car, and he is waiting to be asked for his license and registration. The cop doesn't ask for it. He walks up and looks through the rolled-down window at my friend and says, You guys shouldn't be here. It's dangerous and a bad place. Please leave. Now, I'm not sure about you guys, but hearing a cop say shouldn't and please isn't normal. Usually, we hear can't and now. But that's what he said, and it threw my friend off, and he kind of stammered for words before the cop repeated himself, Please tell me you'll turn around. You shouldn't be here. It's dangerous. This time, though, my friend said yes, sir, and the cop just turned around and walked back to his car, turned off his lights, and drove around us, continuing on the road. That's when I noticed he wasn't driving one of the Tahoes or Chargers they typically drove, but a Crown Vic, and an old Crown Vic, an early 80 square body Crown Victoria car. It was so bizarre, but we didn't think much of it then. We just decided to head straight and follow him and turn around when he did. We followed him for a few seconds up until he went up the hill on the dirt road and went around a curve. Once we got up there past the curve and we noticed he was gone, couldn't see any signs of his vehicle or anything. He wasn't pulled over off the road, so we thought he might have been more familiar with the road and must have sped up to get to the end of it. So we followed the road for a couple more miles, no sign of the cop anywhere, until we got to the end of the road, and it ended in a dead end. The cop was still nowhere to be found, no signs of him passing us pulling off the road, which was barely wide enough for him to pass us while we were pulled off it earlier, and there were no roads connecting to this old dirt road. So many little weird things happened, and... Honestly, I still don't know what I saw or how to explain it. All I can say is that things are weird up there around Red Ash, and even now, I, I still listen to that cop. It's dangerous up there, and I stay away from it. I take a weekly sunset hike through Griffith Park in Los Angeles. Always take the same fire road out after the sun goes down. No flashlight because I know the road well and there's some ambient light from the city. One night as I'm walking down a straight portion of the road, I see the silhouette of a person walking toward me up the road, maybe 500 feet ahead. I don't think anything of it and gaze out over the city for a moment or two. When I look back, the person is gone. I get a bit of an odd feeling, but figure there are probably a number of logical reasons why I don't see the person anymore. I keep walking and come up to a familiar landmark on this stretch of the road, a garbage can. Next to the garbage can, however, is a rather large lump ball-like thing that I don't remember ever seeing before. I start to feel a little more odd or suspicious. I'm staring directly at this lump as I walk past, and I can feel the weight that exists when something is aware of your presence. I rationalize that it's just a big rock I hadn't noticed in the past, and keep moving. I continue another two, three hundred feet down the road and look back over my shoulder. I see the silhouette of the same person, now walking up the road away from me. The next time I'm on the road, I take a minute to examine the area around the garbage can and can't find anything that resembles the lump I saw that night. The only explanation I can think of is that the person saw me coming down the trail, hunched over by the garbage can as I passed, and got up to continue once I was a good distance away. I don't know if the person was afraid of me or if I should have been afraid of it,
My father and a few friends of his used to go out to a ranch in Nevada that was hours away from any human contact to go shooting. Me and my younger family always talked of someday going on our own, and they advised against it. Four years ago, me and two of my cousins and my brother go on our own in a Subaru out back in a Ford F-250 to the spot and found a huge broken down brick house with a pool about 30 by 50 foot. We hard heard from my father that the owner of the house used to be a drug dealer from Mexico that my family knew and his house was blown up by some competitors and the family fled. We set up camp in it and slept that night. The following morning we all wake up to go shooting and drove around for a good spot. As we drove we spotted the ranch my father spoke of in the distance and someone waving at us from the front of the house with four others sitting around the side, cooking something. We waved back and kept going. We finally found a spot that had a hill to shoot it a bit farther away. After we were done, me and my brother went up the same hill to get a view of the area and we saw some clothes and a blanket and went to check it out to find out it was a body that was out in there for a long time. We ran back to the group and got out of there as fast as possible. As we drove back to the main road and down to the city as fast as possible, we all started to get reception again with my brother and my phone getting massive amounts of text. It was from my dad and some of his friends. I called my dad and told him what happened, and he said not to call the cops or go back to the ranch. The people who waved at us were drug dealers who took over the house, and the body was most likely some old competition that got rid of him and took over the ranch. My brother did eventually call the cops, but they never found anything there. My name is Jake, and as a park ranger at Yellowstone National Park, I'd grown accustomed to the unpredictable nature of the wilderness. However, nothing could have prepared me for the bizarre series of events that were about to unfold. It all began when I was called to investigate a string of strange occurrences within the park. I set out on my own, my curiosity piqued by the reports I'd received. As I ventured deeper into the forest, I stumbled upon a mysterious ancient artifact. The object was unlike anything I'd ever seen, and it seemed to emanate an eerie energy that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. As I cautiously examined the artifact, I inadvertently unleashed a powerful supernatural force. This energy surged through the park transforming the local wildlife into horrifying hybrid creatures. A monstrous Bigfoot-like beast emerged from the shadows, its eyes filled with a terrifying intelligence. A snarling werewolf stalked the underbrush, its fangs glistening in the moonlight. Skin-crawling crawlers scuttled through the trees, their movements unnervingly fast and silent. These once familiar creatures had become unknown predators, threatening the very balance of nature within the park. I knew that I couldn't face this threat alone, so I quickly contacted my fellow park rangers. Together we set out to uncover the artifact's origin and find a way to return the creatures to their natural state. As we delved into ancient texts and consulted with experts in the field, we discovered that the artifact was the key to both unleashing and reversing the supernatural force. With time running out, we devised a plan to neutralize the energy and save the park. Our mission was fraught with danger as we faced off against the deadly predators. We relied on our training, resourcefulness, and unwavering determination to see us through the harrowing ordeal. In the end, we managed to perform the ritual necessary to reverse the transformation, using the artifact as the conduit for the energy. As the supernatural force dissipated, the creatures reverted to their original forms, their monstrous features fading away. Exhausted but relieved, we returned the artifact to its resting place, ensuring that it could never again unleash the terrifying power it held within. We vowed to keep the events that transpired a secret, protecting both the park and the world from the knowledge of the supernatural force that had nearly tipped the scales of nature into chaos.
After reading some of your experiences, I wanted to share my own to see if I could get your opinions on what me and my family saw in the Black Hills of South Dakota. About five years ago, when I was 17, I visited some of my family who lived in South Dakota and worked there for the summer. After about a month, my brother, sister, and her husband decided to do what Americans do best and go shoot guns in the woods. I had to work a evening shift, so it was decided we'd go after, around 10 p.m. Once my shift ended, we went to their house to pack up the truck with some snacks, guns, and ammo. The drive took around 45 minutes, and it took us up a dirt road surrounded by trees and tall grass. Eventually, it opened up into a clearing that was pretty open and flat. The nearest tree line was about 100 feet away. It was pretty dark, but the clearing was lit up by the truck's headlights. I kind of felt uneasy, but I chalked that up to just being in the woods at night. For the first 20 minutes, nothing really happened. We were just setting up plastic bottles in those plastic gallon buckets you'd get water out of at an office. There was a feeling of being watched that we all felt. The area suddenly reeked of spoiled eggs. Those of you who have shot guns know they can smell, but even since going the military, no amount of guns and explosions have smelt this bad. We looked around to see if we could see the source, and what I saw I can still vividly remember to this day. What I saw was a thin humanoid figure crouching down, looking at us. Even while crouching down, it was still about six feet in height. When I say this figure was thin, I mean skin and bones barely do it justice. The even weirder thing about this was we all saw the figure in different spots in the tree line, but we all described the same features. Tall, thin, had long, dark hair. We quickly packed up what we could and left. The feeling of dreading felt that day will forever haunt me. Since then, my brother mentioned the area might have been in native territory. But I don't know how, if that's true. Every once in a while, I think back on that day, and I look up different stories and encounters people have in woods. But nothing quite resembles what I saw that day. I was hiking down to the beach with two mates. We came across a sign that advised not to proceed down to the rocks as it was quite steep and it was easy to get trapped out there once the tide came in. After watching the sunset at taking some pictures, two of us were into photography. We saw someone coming our way with high vest shirt on. We were a little concerned as we thought it might be a ranger coming to tell us that we weren't supposed to be there. We noticed when he got a little closer that things were a bit off, however. His shirt had symbols and markings on it that had been drawn in permanent marker. He had a weird look in his eye as though he was a bit unstable. He came up to us and asked if we had seen any caves in the area. We advised that we hadn't. He then sat down with us. We weren't really sure what to do, so all four of us just sat in silence for about 30 minutes or so. We could tell he was unstable and didn't want to risk setting him off. Eventually, he, he said so, how you boys doing? We replied, good. You, to which he said, yeah, better now and then, got up and walked back the way he'd come. This story was told to me by an uncle. He is a park ranger in Ontario. He frequently comments on his work being relatively calm after pandemic mostly because there are fewer tourists. However, he still has to go out in the wilderness and check on his stuff. One day, he had to go through the woods with a colleague, and there were reports of people hanging around without permission. Nothing unusual, just some visitors who are just mean teenagers. Sometimes the issue with these reports was that there were numerous sightings of people carrying all sorts of luggage like axes and animal skulls. Just weird stuff. People can be pretty racist in these parts. It's possible these are the Algonquin people. After all, this is their land. Like imagine unhinged people worshipping Odin in the cold wilderness of modern-day Canada. 
Aside from whatever occult stuff they were pulling up, according to my uncle, you can find many loons, madmen, and weird people in the wood. There was a word of bonfires, and it was what truly worried the rangers. Nobody was in the mood to deal with a fire in the middle of a health apocalypse, especially considering the past events in California and the Amazonian jungle. Like Canada, surely it is cold, but nobody wanted to see mass fires provoked by mad people. So they hiked across the wilderness and saw all the normal things. They checked on the state of the trails, if the seasonal animals were doing fine, the state of vegetation and that sort of stuff. The further they advanced, the more they began to find strange things, odd symbols carved into the tree's crust. Some seemed like runes, residues such as trash. Those weird Odin worshippers didn't mind eating modern-day snacks. It seemed marks on the ground and small signals here and there about people camping in places not for the general public. Like people had been actively going around the wilderness, but my uncle and his colleague, John, let's call him that, never encountered campers. Whoever was going around had already left. My uncle and his partner would always find weird stuff, like one time a cape and a helmet and even a real sword. Someone had been putting on some Nordic cult stuff or something like that. There would also be incense and some other religious miscellaneous items. One night, my uncle and John decided to settle their camp next to a huge elm tree with the hopes of the tree covering their tent from the winds at night when temperatures would reach very, very low. They ate heated beans and rice while talking about stuff and exchanging stories. Every night, they'd use a portable radio to talk with people in the base area, exchanging news. At some point, my uncle's colleague goes to the trees to empty his bladder, and my uncle waits by the fire. Nothing out of the blue. The time passes, and my uncle does not hear John returning. His partner was this huge man in his forties a chatty person whom you'd frequently hear even before he reached the camp. So my uncle begins looking at the sides to catch a glimpse of what was going on, but he saw nothing. John was carrying a lantern, so at least one could have expected to see the lights by the trees, but all my uncle saw was black. The minutes began to pass, and he called for John, asking if things were fine. No, that's when he realized the woods were strangely quiet. There was no wind, nor the natural sounds you'd expect to hear at night. Nothing. And that got him on alert. John would sometimes play a harmless prank or two, especially considering their line of work wasn't the most active of them all, and they spent days outside. But this time, things were too calm and quiet to be natural. Things were off. My uncle knew it, so he began to ask towards the nothingness if everything was okay. Was Joan fine? Where was he? Nobody answered. Well, the wind did. It started to blow stronger and stronger. It straight up seemed like somebody was trying to settle in the atmosphere of a horror movie. My uncle then heard a subtle whisper at his right side. He tried to pay attention to the sound and pulling his body to that side. It was a man's voice, a weak one. My uncle got up, grabbed his light and the rifle, went into the woods, the fire was weak enough to make sure no accidents would happen while he was away, so he walked towards the bigger trees. He kept on asking if John was fine. The voice was slowly getting stronger the more he entered into the wilderness, until he could hear Joan's voice calling his name for help. That's when my uncle stops. Something was off. Even if that voice seemed like John's, he's already had to help him once. In the times John seriously asked for help, his tone was different, like the voice was the same, so the modulations, but the tone did not match. And the tone of our voices is pretty much dictated by our, our moods. This was not John. A ball of anxiety grew in my uncle's body, and he is one of the more stoic and calm men I've ever met. The certainty was there. Something that wasn't John was calling for him. But my uncle had his rifle and light prepared. He never went to the church or seemed to believe in that sort of thing. But he also told me that sometimes you had to respect the rules of the wild. He began to move the lights in front of him to the side, inside alert, 
and waiting. If Jun was fooling around, he already would have seen it. But what my uncle saw was something else entirely. It was very tall, like four or five meters. In front of my uncle was a very small clearing surrounded by older and taller trees. The figure was a shady thing around eight or nine meters away from him. It had no gender and was too tall to be a person. The creature was thin and had antlers. In fact, it seemed like its head was a moose's skull. It was blurry at first. He thought those weird cultists were using an animal's head, but it was far too large and tall to be a person. It would have to have been very uncomfortable to walk around in that. In the middle of the night, in the short hairs of my uncle's nape stood up, this being moved towards him. My uncle yelled out as a warning. It stayed quiet, and he readied his rifle. It called him with Joan's voice, but much more distorted and crackly. My uncle firing into the air, then turning on his heels and running. The sound that thing made was not human. My uncle ran and ran, even though I listened to the dark wilderness, which, unfortunately, he got lost and had to wait for daylight to find the trail. He only had his light and even that was dying. In the morning, John was there, waiting for him, worried. He had heard my uncle calling for him at night, and another bunch of weird, strange noises that he could not quite understand. When he had returned to the campsite, nobody was there. My uncle was not answering his calls, and so this is what they both believed to have been a wendigo. I'm not too sure about that either, is he? but it's definitely speculated that what they saw and encountered was of the supernatural. Hiking by full moon light near Joshua Tree with some friends, it was around 2 a.m. We come across this massive natural amphitheater with huge boulders lining the sides like a well-organized audience, uniform rows starting at the bottom and rising the cliff walls up maybe 150 feet. Continue walking into the amphitheater, feel chilling air as if being watched or that something was impending. See a large figure in the center about halfway up, looked half rock, half human in general shape. Continue walking. Anxiety intensifies. Can literally hear and feel the presence of this figure. Group of eight dudes? Nope the F out of there. No clue what it was or was not. Never went back. All right, I have no idea how to format or write this, considering it is my first time ever seeing something paranormal, but yesterday I spent the night at a friend's house. I will call them Sam and Bob for privacy reasons. Everyone else's name will also be changed. It was Sam, Bob, Jeff, and I. Sam and Bob are brothers. Anyways, Jeff and I had came over and brought our dirt bikes, so naturally we spent the day riding. We had also ran to a store and picked up some fireworks to let off that night. We had quit riding at around 7. Keep in mind, this is eastern Kentucky in the middle of the woods and farmland because Sam and Bob's family are loaded with money. Since we had finished riding and it was getting pretty dark, we decided to light some fireworks. We had been lighting some smaller firecrackers and fountains and whatnot, but... Jeff had the idea to have a Roman candle war. In the middle of the war, when we were grabbing new candles, we heard a whoosh which ended up being a used Roman candle firing a shot in the grass. But we didn't know that immediately, and Sam made the comment that it was probably a Wendigo, unto which Bob and Sam get in a huge argument about if Wendigos live in Kentucky or not. This blew up and ended with resolving it with a pillow fight on a trampoline. After we were all gassed out, I decided we should spend all night on the trampoline. At around nine or ten-ish, Jeff and I spotted some coyotes at a tree line across the road from us. We all went inside because... I freaked out because I'm from a city and don't like wild animals. Also, it stunk really bad. It smelled like dead rabbit or deer. Probably the coyotes got something. So we all go inside, but leave the pillows and blankets on the trampoline. After about an hour, inside Sam tells us we forgot the bedding on the trampoline, and he wanted me and Jeff to go get it. 
I, being terrified of the dark, beg Jeff to come with me. He agrees, and we throw our socks and shoes on and head out the back door onto the patio or porch. We go down the stairs and towards the trampoline. I am behind Jeff, grabbing the back of his shirt, and he has a flashlight pointing straight. I'm looking to the right, towards past the road, looking for the coyotes, but I hear a thud sound to our left. I look over there, and there is a line of four trees parallel with us. They are shaped in a V, starting at the base. I don't see anything, but I tell Jeff to point the flashlight over there, and we don't see anything. So he swings it straight and keeps walking. I hear the thud this time. But this time Jeff also hears it. It is much, much, much louder. It's still to our left. Jeff swings the flashlight in between the second and third tree in the row and it's walking straight with us. Not at us, but towards the same direction we were going. As soon as the flashlight lands on it, it's behind the third tree now, and it stands up in the middle of the V of the tree. It stood about four or five heads taller than me, and M five feet nine. It was incredibly skinny, as in, I could see its rib. Through its skin, which was a bright white, like not fluorescent white, but when the flashlight hit it, it definitely had a glow. Its eyes were the scariest part, two big reflective orbs that were dark gray or blackish, but here is the catch they were reflective in a sense, like the eyes illuminated the flashlight back at us. Also his hands were gigantic, its fingers wrapped around the tree trucks, and they were super long. Jeff looks over, and I scream, and he just stands still. I turn around, and he is still standing, but he dropped the flashlight. I still have his shirt in my hand, and I yank him hard, and he just takes off in front of me. I sprint past him and up the back porch stairs. He falls on the stairs, and I run to the door and open it and wait for him as soon as he runs through. I slam it shut and lock the deadbolt and shut the curtains and jump back onto their couch. Sam and Bob were putting their socks and shoes on when we ran inside because they had heard me scream my lungs out. Jeff is standing on the couch, and he starts babbling and tell them what he saw, and I started hyperventilating. I have anxiety and asthma and had an asthma attack. I haven't had one in years, and I stopped carrying my emergency inhaler a long time ago. Sam is bewildered, and I started crying while I was having my fit. I cried for almost an hour and didn't fall asleep until almost 3 a.m., I woke up and packed, and my parents came and scooped me up, so I'm now writing this from my house. If you have any questions or answers, please tell. God bless y'all. My husband came home with this story, and he does not believe in Bigfoot. Him and a friend went up to Dead Horse Lake to go fishing for an overnight fishing trip. He said it was around 10 p.m., and they were standing by the fire, talking, when they heard a very loud scream. He said about 30 seconds after the first scream stopped, they heard another one that was quieter and shorter. They both looked at each other and said, what in the hell was that? They did not hear it again. Whatever it was scared the hell out of them, and they went and got into the pickup and locked the doors. He did say that he has never, ever hear a sound like that before. My husband and his friend are big-time hunters. A few weeks ago, I hiked up to Lake Serene in Index, Washington. I started late and ended up at the lake around sunset. Seeing the sunset from high up is mesmerizing. I couldn't stop looking at the vivid colors. It was amazing how the purple mountains, the teal sky, and the orange light mixed together. As soon as the sun dropped, I realized very suddenly that I had a two-hour hike back to my car. I was prepared for this. I had my headlamp, and, and I had hiked alone at night before. I was okay up higher in the steep terrain, but as I got lower and the terrain leveled out, and I could hear running water, I started to get uncomfortable. This is where the critters would be. As I passed a fairly loud waterfall and rounded a corner, my surrounding went from loud white noise to almost complete silence in a few seconds. 
I felt an intense chill just from the silence. Somehow it was better with all the noise. Anyway, almost as soon as I was freaked out by the silence, I heard something that sounded like a person popping their knuckle. Not a branch cracking, but a knuckle popping. I froze. I was terrified. Then I heard a thud with some decent bass to it and a breathy grunt. Then I heard the leaves rustle. I could hear everything because I'd stepped into a wired, silent spot. I was freaking out. I wanted to know where it was so I could maybe freak it out with my headlamp and yelling. I was looking for eyes glowing back at me, but I couldn't find anything. It was so much worse not knowing what was making the noise. I got very loud. I blew my emergency whistle a couple of times to scare it away. The worst part was that I still had another hour of walking through the pitch black mountain forest ahead of me. I was full on terrified the whole time. I was clapping and whistling loudly the whole way. If someone had come across me, I would have seemed crazy. I had no idea what I ran into, or if it was flowing me the whole time. Sometimes I would stop making noise, and I would swear I heard it again, but I never saw its eyes. I've seen some crazy stuff in the mountains, but this simple experience of bumping into a creature in the night and not being able to identify it was truly the most terrifying experience of my life. I was hiking a local but rarely used trail a couple winters back. The sun was setting so the woods were starting to get dark, but no worries as I only had a couple miles left to get back to my car. I came to a spot in the trail where it winds down a rather steep 40-foot high ledge. I stopped for a minute to gather myself and pick my route down the ledge when I spotted someone down below, near a small stream crossing about 50 feet from the bottom of the ledge. I couldn't see the person very well in the gathering darkness, but I noticed he appeared to be dressed head to foot in all-white clothing. Unusual, but not all that weird, I figured. I picked my way down the ledge, mostly facing uh, toward the rock as I went, so I didn't see the guy again until I was at the bottom. By that time, I was close enough to see that he was not wearing all white clothing. He was, in fact, naked except for a pair of tidy whiteies and a fur hat with ear flaps deployed. As soon as I saw him, he appeared to duck down behind a low mound. The trail went right where he was, so I proceeded forward because, you know, no big deal, right? After taking a few steps in his direction, I realized he was actually sitting in the stream, in his underwear, in the rapidly darkening woods. In winter, there was snow on the ground, two miles from the nearest trailhead road. He finally looks over at me and says, you're probably wondering what I'm doing, right? Yeah, I was wondering about that. You okay? Yep, I'm doing one of those polar bear challenges next week and thought I should get some practice in beforehand. Okay. He climbs out of the stream and starts walking over to me. I don't know if this guy is legit or just a crazy person, so I start moving up the trail toward a junction a very short distance past the creek crossing. I stop there for a minute to read the trail sign and verify I'm going the right way, and he catches up to me. He gets a little closer to me than I'd like, him being basically naked and all, so I casually take a step back, and he promptly takes a step forward, closing the gap once again. Are you heading toward road name, he says. I was, but didn't want him to know where I'm going, as he's starting to freak me out a little bit, standing there in his underwear, dripping wet. No. I tell him I'm heading the other way, toward other road. That's a long way. Yeah, I'm training for a long snow hike and trying to get some miles in. It's going to be dark soon. I could give you a ride to your car. No thanks, I was planning to be out late and have my headlamp with me. You sure? Yep. Thanks for the offer, though. There's a long pause here while we both study the trail sign, or pretend to. Then he turns to me and says, You probably think I'm some kind of crazy person, don't you? Well, you were sitting naked in a stream in the middle of winter, I say jokingly. Yeah, I could see how that looks a bit odd. No worries. 
I've probably done some pretty odd things in my life. Yeah, like what? I didn't know what to say, as I wasn't sure I'd actually done anything that odd before. So I say, oh, I don't know. I'm sure there's something. Anyway, I need to get moving. You sure you're okay? Yeah, I'm good. Hey, maybe I'll go that way with you, and you could maybe give me a ride back to my car. Okay, so there's no way I'm doing that. I just want to get away from this guy who I suddenly notice is either really well hung or is getting about a half a chub. Dude, you're naked and wet. It's literally freezing out, and it's five miles to the other end of the trail. You should probably just get back to your car and get some dry clothes on and warm up. Yeah, you're probably right. With that, he turns and starts jogging up the trail. Since I actually needed to go that way, I considered following him after giving him a healthy head start, but couldn't shake the thought of him ducking off the trail and waiting for me to come by. So I hiked the other direction to a point where I could loop back to my car on a different trail. I was glad to finally see my car. By now, it was around 8 p.m., and jumped in and locked the door before changing into my street shoes. I looked around to see if there were any cars parked nearby, but didn't see any. However, as I left the parking lot, I, I did see an older Jeep Cherokee parked along the road. I couldn't tell if anyone was in it, but didn't waste any time getting back to some place less remote. My name is Naya, and I am a spirited young woman of the tribe that resides near the Great Lake. Our village has always been a place of serenity, surrounded by the whispers of ancient spirits and the quiet lapping of the lake's water on the shore. Lately, however, strange occurrences have begun to plague our people. It all started when a colossal serpent-like creature emerged from the depths of the lake. The elders spoke in hushed tones of the legends surrounding this beast, and fear gripped the hearts of our tribe members. It was clear that we needed a champion to protect our people from the impending doom. As fate would have it, the tribe shaman chose me for this task, citing my strong connection to the spirits. I was both honored and terrified by this responsibility, but I knew that I could not let my tribe down. As I set out on my quest, I encountered a warrior from a rival tribe who was also searching for a way to defeat the serpent. His strength and courage captivated me, and I couldn't help but fall in love with him. But as our people faced annihilation, I knew that I had to choose between my love for this warrior and my duty to my tribe. I came up with a plan to imitate the serpent's behavior and movements, hoping to confuse it into believing it was seeing its own reflection. If successful, this might cause the creature to question its actions or reveal its weaknesses. As the serpent rose from the lake, I began to mirror its movements, slithering and twisting through the water. At first, the creature seemed puzzled, staring at me with its cold, unblinking eyes. Gradually, its confusion turned to agitation, and I could sense that my plan was working. In a moment of desperation, the serpent lunged toward me, revealing the vulnerable spot beneath its head. I knew that this was my chance to strike and end the beast's reign of terror, but I also knew that doing so would require the ultimate sacrifice. With a heavy heart, I made my decision. I would give my life to protect my people and the ones I loved. As I plunged my weapon into the serpent's vulnerability, I felt a sense of peace wash over me knowing that my sacrifice would not be in vain. As the serpent let out its final agonizing cry and sank back into the depths of the lake, the people of both tribes bore witness to the end of the beast's terror. My sacrifice had not only saved our people, but also brought a new era of unity between the tribes. In the end, the memory of my actions would live on in the hearts and minds of our people, my love for the warrior from the rival tribe serving as a symbol of the unity that now bound us together. And as the lake's mystical waters continued to lap against the shore, our story would become a legend passed down through the generations.
My parents owned a cabin in the woods of Virginia. Shortly after purchasing it, both my mother and sister told me they thought the cabin was haunted. I didn't laugh, but I laughed to myself. I don't believe in that sort of thing. They said that they would lock the door at night and wake up in the morning and the door would be sitting wide open. My sister said she thought someone was pranking them and even accused me of driving two hours into the countryside to prank them, then turn around and drive two one, two hours home. No, I did not do that. So I dismissed their silliness. So about a year or two later, I decided it would be cool to visit the cabin during the winter. Everyone waited until good weather to go. I had just bought a jeep, and it was supposed to snow a few inches, so it seemed like a fun adventure. I drove to the cabin, and it was staring to lightly snow when I arrived. It was very cold inside and out at 12 degrees it. I lit the wood stove and stoked it up to warm up the place up, and it was taking forever. I got the temperature up to about 35 indoors and decided to go to bed. So remembering the stories about the door, I checked both doors, locked them, and pulled hard on the knobs to ensure they were actually locked while laughing to myself. I put an extra quilt on the bed, crawled into the freezing bed, which warmed up quickly and fell asleep. I had this nightmare that I woke up, and the cabin was incredibly cold, so I walked from the bedroom to the living area to relight the wood stove, and the door was sitting open. I turned to my right, and there was a seven-foot-tall humanoid creature which had an exoskeleton, like an insect. Its eyes were red, and its knees bent opposite of human, like some birds. The nightmare startled me awake. I was laying there in bed for a moment, and I realized that the room was incredibly cold. I got up to go check the fire, and when I stepped into the living area, the door was sitting wide open, and snow had blown in on the floor. Remembering the dream and the creature, the area where the creature stood was pitch black dark. I frantically fumbled for the light switch, and the lights came on, and nothing was there. I got dressed and walked to the door and looked at the snow. There were no footprints of any kind in or outside the cabin door. I'd like to add that at no time did we ever arrive at the cabin to find the door open. The door opened only when people were staying in the cabin. It also was not dependent on the fire being lit. One of my theories was it was heat expansion, but my family stayed there during nice weather and rarely lit a fire. I never stayed alone in the cabin again. A few years back, I was visiting Australia with my family. We're visiting some friends in Mildura, and we decided to go visit an old sheep shearing building that was historic or something. Anyhow, the doors to the farm, like building, are shut, and while we're standing around taking photos, classical music is playing. Not a recording or anything. It, it sounded like people using violins and trumpets. I'm an awful writer, so I can't really explain it but it just sounded like someone was doing it for a party. Then it stopped. No instruments. And all the folding chairs folded up. I ignored it, assuming it was probably just a radio. But then, once we left about ten meters, we hear a blood-curling scream. It sounded like a man. And we run inside the farm, and nothing's there. Two stories, but not incredibly out in the wilderness stories, these happened in the woods by my suburban house. First, three years ago, my mom and I were home alone, and we went to bed. I woke up because of a bright light in my room. This was a school day, so I was worried I missed my alarm. I went to my window and, and looked outside, and the night sky looked as clear as day. It was spectacular. The moon and a few of the brighter stars were in a blue sky that was darker and eventually black at the horizon, and you could see the color of the grass and trees and flowers we planted. I was absolutely mesmerized by it, and then I checked my phone and remember thinking, WTF, it's 1 a.m. I don't remember how long I stayed looking outside, but eventually I woke my mom up and showed her, and we were both stunned. 
It happened a few more times, but I haven't seen a night sky so visible ever since. Second story is a bit short and cliché. Found an abandoned house, but this one is in a thicket maybe a block away from mine. I went with a few friends in the winter to explore it after a big snowball fight. We found vials filled with clear liquid, televisions, an intact Chevy Chevette. We went further in the house and what I presumed to be its yard, which barely had a roof in more, and found chairs around tables and makeshift fire pits which looked recently placed. Finally, we found piles of black trash bags buried in the snow. After opening one, we saw that they were filled with decomposing clothing and boots. At that point, we all decided hard nope friends and buggered off out of there. After talking about it recently, we think it may have been some junkies hideout, which is unnerving since this house is only a block away from mine, 30 feet away from a major pedestrian bike path and right behind the school. I won't name the exact place for fear someone might try and go there and find her. I can't be responsible for that. I didn't want to go at first. I begged, pleaded, maybe even cried a little, but my friends Eric and Jimmy were going, and that was the sword my parents used to cleave through my complaints. You'll be with your friends. It's only a few weeks, and it'll be a good experience for you to be a little independent for once, my mom said. Independence? Hell yes, just not at a stupid sleep, away camp. Drop-off was on a Sunday. The air was thick and spongy, a hazy sky threatening rain. Basically your typical August sweat fest. My younger brother Matty had a fever the night before, and with my dad working, my mom couldn't leave him so I had to catch a ride with it, Eric. I remember accusing Maddie of being a little baby and lying about being sick just to get attention, something not uncommon in our house, but on this occasion completely untrue, which of course infuriated my mom. She rarely yelled, but for some reason this seemed to penetrate her calm and she exploded on me. Looking back, it was about Maddie, it wasn't about my mom, it was about me. I was afraid. Afraid of something new. Something different. Something unknown. Eric was slightly more excited about the camp than I was. Of the three of us, he had the sunniest disposition. Nothing really ever bothered him. I think that was especially true that summer because he knew he was leaving our small town and going to boarding school next year. His dad was a big ad exec who commuted to the city, something mostly unheard of where we lived, and they lived in a gigantic waterfront house. Everything always seemed easy for him, but looking back, I never considered how different he must have felt sometimes. He never showed it, though. His armor was an easy smile and quick wit, but over the course of our two-hour drive, I was able to wear him down and get him firmly on board with my theory that this was going to be the worst weeks of our lives. If I'd only know, that would actually come true. I remember as Eric's mom turned off the highway, it was like we were entering another world. The trees were suddenly taller, long branches with broad leaves standing guard over this ancient green kingdom. A mile or two later, we approached the entrance to the camp a dirt field which gave way to well-trodden grass with the silhouettes of the cabins beyond. A permanent dust cloud hung over it. I remember Eric's mom being frustrated because no matter how much she cranked the windshield wipers, a new film settled moments later. A kaleidoscope of metallic colors glinted through the swirling dust as cars arrived. I stared as kids my age and older, my size and bigger spilled out. Some looked hypnotized in a state of disbelief of their current whereabouts, while others were loudly greeting friends from years gone by. And still others were sobbing. I watched one boy who oddly enough looked like me but with slightly longer hair. He locked himself in the car after his parents had gotten out. I never got to see how that self-hostage situation was resolved. Oh, and there were girls. It was a co-ed camp with fairly rigid separation, as we would learn. 
I was in that awkward phase where a girlfriend was pretty much a rumor, but subconsciously my stance on the whole opposite sex issue began to soften about that time. Eric's mom ushered us out. As I was grabbing my backpack and duffel out of the trunk, I felt a sharp sting on the back of my neck. Initially, I thought it was a bee, and I'd already envisioned Eric's mom, leaving with one passenger in tow due to a slight allergy to bee stings. But it wasn't. I heard Jimmy's unmistakable howl and turned to see my friend with a palm full of pebbles in his hand. That was Jimmy, all fun, all the time. He was smaller than Eric and I, but completely fearless. I'd seen him take on kids twice his size and win. As Eric and Jimmy's moms jabbered away, the three of us stood in the dust, and for a moment, my fear slipped away, and we seemed invincible, the three of us. Together, this camp didn't stand a chance. Eric's mom's goodbye went on entirely too long. I did miss not having my own mother to hug and assure me that it was going to be fun, and someday I'd look back on this experience as a moment of change and growing up. One of those sentiments all these years later I wish I'd expressed to her more at the time. As the moms finally pulled away, it did feel different. It somehow felt right, like we were about to do something epic on our own. The cabins were split by a great lawn nearly a football field in length, boys on one side, girls on the other, both divided by age. The counselors lined us up and cross, checked everyone's name on the list. A simmering anarchy rose over the field, veteran campers seeing one another again for the first time since last summer, new campers trying to find their place, and counselors attempting not to lose their sin the first few hours. This was the around the time I first noticed her. Not Allison R. from Cabin 6, my first real crush, but the very tall girl standing at the back of the line, drifting near the edge of the woods as if she was trying to disappear back into them. I thought it was a maintenance worker or some other camp employee, and frankly a man because of her sheer size. Her broad shoulders were hunched, and she slouched as if she was trying to hide her odd proportions and all the chaos, but she had to be over six feet tall, maybe more. Her shirt and pants were oversized and ill-fitting, but you could still discern there was a solid frame beneath. She was built differently. She had a backpack double-strapped tightly over her shoulders, and the top met the length of her neatly cut hair. Something jutted out of the unfastened side of the pack. A doll of some kind. Eric elbowed me. He'd noticed her, too. Holy ass, she's huge. I didn't respond. He and Jimmy shared a snicker, then moved on to other faces in the crowd. Everyone was sizing everyone else up, looking for commonality, targeting difference. I couldn't take my eyes off the girl, and eventually she must have felt it and met my stare. Even at that distance I froze, embarrassed, sure, but it was as if she'd come alive in that instant. She remained expressionless, but there was just something powerful about her eyes. There was a story there, a story that wanted to be told. I quickly looked away, but could feel her linger on me a moment as if she didn't want to break the connection. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw her head lower again, and she receded back into the crowd. I should have walked over and said, hello or good morning, introduced myself, and asked how she was doing, where she was from, anything. But I did. Our cabin had four other boys in it. One whose name I can't remember was our age, but the others were all 17 or 18. It wasn't long until a serious lord of the flies vibe set in. The ringleader was a kid named Corey. He sucked. It was like he'd gone to bullying school and graduated with honors already. The other idiots just fell in line with him, and it was obvious they'd had a few summers together to sharpen their craft. The problem for them is they hadn't encountered a Jimmy before. I knew we had a secret weapon, and part of me wanted them to just keep prodding it enough for it to explode and annihilate them. Things came to a head the first night. We'd gotten back from some boring orientation. Meet your fellow camper thing, and I was lying in my bottom bunk. Eric got stuck with a kid whose name I can't remember, and Jimmy was above me. 
Given some downtime, thoughts about how bad I wanted to go home began to creep back into my head. I stared at the cracks in the bunk frame above me, started to find strange faces in them, and was in the beginnings of a possible scenario where they might begin talking and perhaps even possess me to put me out of my misery when a shadow fell over me. It was Corey and the idiots. They'd decided I was the weak link in the new herd and they were about to pounce. Hey, if Stick, that's your name, right? If Stick, it was so predictable and generic, I really wanted to ask him if his mother was proud her son was dumber than a rock. But instead, instinct kicked in, and I sat up and swung one leg out of bed, braced for what might be coming. My dad had taught me how to throw a punch, and I'd wrestled for a few years. So I knew how to handle myself, but I didn't want this fight. I didn't want most fights. I was okay with just letting it be. It was if they knew that, and it was fueling them. Corey took my water bottle out of my bag, opened the lid, and soaked me. The idiots laughed, braying like hyenas. Did you like that F stick? Then he was crumpled on the floor, bleeding. It all happened so fast. Jimmy had been watching from his perch above, watching and waiting. He'd decided the water bottle crossed his red line and launched off the top bed. He delivered such a quick, explosive beating that the idiots didn't have time to react, let alone jump in. I got my ass out of bed, too, just to make sure they didn't. Jimmy didn't say a thing, didn't gloat, he didn't need to. He just looked at the three of them and made it clear it would be worse next time if they decided to F with us again. Word did get back to the counselors of an incident, but Corey's bloody, possibly broken nose was explained away as an unfortunate case of walking into a door face first. Things were just different back in the day. Seemed you could get away with more. Kids scraped their knees on the pavement, fell out of a tree, and broke their arms. They had scars. It wasn't that bad things didn't happen. The news just didn't travel as fast. I met Allison the next day. First kiss a few nights later, but this isn't about that. This is about telling you what really happened that summer, what they covered up. This is about Jane and what they drove her to do. I didn't know at the time, but it started before someone hung her doll from the big oak, which marked the dividing line between the girls' and boys' cabin. Boys can be mean, but girls can be downright cruel. On the fourth or fifth day, we were on our way back from the field when kids started gathering on the great lawn. A low murmur rose, interrupted by the occasional obnoxious cackle. Hanging from the lowest branch of the great oak was a two-foot doll. The face was strangely lifelike, not overly cherubic like most plastic toys, but elegantly carved and made with care. The long hair seemed real finely threaded into what appeared to be a wooden scalp. The doll wore overalls, their stitching also expertly done. A rope had been tied around both her hands and looped over the bow, effectively hanging her like a medieval prisoner on the rack. We all stopped and stared. The angle the doll's head lolled gave it an almost ebbing life. Then the crowd began to part, and I saw her head loom over everyone. Jane slowly walked to the tree. I was awestruck at the power of her stride. Something that sighs moving so effortlessly, wordlessly, she reached up to the tall branch and untied the knot of the loop, let the doll ride the slack down into her other waiting hand. She looked it over carefully, meticulously. A girl yelled, is that your only friend, you freak? A wave of laughter swept through the crowd. Jane turned, gazed still on her doll. When she finally looked up, everyone fell into a hush. Her eyes were cold, unfeeling, almost inhuman, like the eyes of a shark. She scanned the crowd as if she knew who did it, then silently walked back to her cabin. By this time, the counselors intervened and everyone dispersed. I didn't know who did it, but heard from Allison that one of the female counselors, a college girl named Tessa, was in on it. She let the girls in her cabin drink and seemed more than happy to stir up trouble. We began to hear rumors about Jane, that her family owned some of the land the camp was on, that Jane wasn't her real name, 
that it was an alias because she committed some awful crime, that she lived in the woods and ate animals, that she killed her parents, that she was a circus freak that escaped, and on and on. But it seemed no one really knew anything about her other than her name was Jane. I should have said I was sorry that happened to her and that kid sucked sometimes. I should have asked if she wanted to hang with me and Eric and Jimmy. I should have, but I didn't. The next night it got worse. We didn't see it happen, but we heard the aftermath. Tessa and her underlings locked Jane in one of the bathrooms. There was a central hub for each set of cabins that had toilets and showers, but there was also a single stall out near a maintenance shed. No one used it except the counselors, and I don't know how they lured her in there. Maybe she just wanted some privacy, and they followed her. We heard her deep, bellowing screams, her fists pounding on the door. Her pleas for someone to please let her out, but no one did. By the time other counselors and campers arrived, it was quiet. When they opened the door, the bathroom was empty. The back window was completely shattered, and a few boards had been torn out, creating a hole large enough to escape. At the time, no one quite knew exactly what was going on, and the counselors did their best to sequester us for the next day. A few of them partnered and searched for her on the campgrounds and as far as they dared go into the forest, but there were no sign. Jane was gone. I'm sure calls were made to her parents and maybe the police, so we waited for someone to show up distraught, looking for her, but no one did. It was as if she didn't exist, as if she didn't matter. Tessa went missing the next day. When she didn't show for breakfast, they checked her room and found a familiar doll sitting upright in her bed instead. One of the campers heard they found a fistful of hair with chunks of scalp still attached to it near the door, as if whoever took her simply dragged her by the hair like a rag doll. Things descended into chaos at that point. This time, the police did show up. Parents did too, demanding answers. We all left in a matter of hours. My mom picked us up this time. I'd never been so happy to see her. Somehow, the news barely made the papers. But again, it was a different time. The owner of the camp had an inn with some influential people, and they managed to keep it mostly quiet. My best guess is money changed hands, probably more than a few times. A local reporter did some digging, and there were records of Jane from one of the nearby elementary schools, but they stopped after the third or fourth grade, and it was impossible to match the schoolgirl photo to the Jane I knew. Police led search parties deployed, and they combed the forest. They found several huge old ramshackle longhouses hidden miles within its depths. The ceilings that weren't collapsed were over twenty feet high. The skeletal remains of an adult male and female were discovered buried behind the main cabin in a makeshift graveyard. The skeletons were abnormally large, and according to a third-hand account from the coroner several hundred years old, with several peculiar anatomical anomalies. They also found the skeletons of three infants and four juveniles, all with various defects. In the surrounding forest they found burial mounds. They were filled with animal bones. The bones were scraped with what apparently resembled human, like teeth marks, only larger than any human tooth could leave behind. Allegedly, several tomes were recovered, but none were officially recorded in any evidentiary findings. I personally inquired about them, and if they do exist, no one's talking. That same industrious local reporter alleged to have gotten a quick peek at one, but was unable to transcribe more than a few notes. He never published his findings, but I contacted him a few years back and got him talking over a bottle of wine. The tomes were nearly indecipherable, written in an ancient language resembling Germanic, perhaps an offshoot of an early strain of Latin but what he ranted about most was that they were cobbled with a peculiar runic tech. He showed me his original notes, strange symbols and words that just felt like they were from another time, a different, much older time. Eoten is the one that stuck with me. It's an early English word derived from the Norse, Jotun. 
It roughly translates to giant. Eric, Jimmy, and I remained close. Even after college, Eric eventually moved overseas, but Jimmy stayed local. A few years ago, we got together and eventually talked about what happened. Talked about if we should, if we could have done anything different to change it. A simple hello. A kind word may have changed everything. As close as we are, I got the distinct impression neither wants to talk about it anymore. They've locked it away in some dark corner of their minds where the stuff we don't want to remember lies and waits. Despite wanting to forget, I've kept close tabs on any new information that trickles out relating to the incident. The occasional missing person in the area makes me wonder if someone wandered too far off the beaten path. I tried driving out to the camp once, but they ran part of the highway across it, and wilderness is somewhat filled in the rest. The woods looked as old and deep as they were all those years ago. I quelled an urge to just wander off and see if she would find me. I think Jane's still out there surviving, watching, waiting for her time to come again. Maybe she isn't as alone as we think she is. Who knows how long they've adapted to hide in plain sight like she did. But I always come back to the same haunting thought. It wasn't that I did something wrong. It was that I didn't do something right. My name is... Akeshita, and I was once a brave and gifted warrior among my people. Our tribe lived in harmony with the land, our peaceful existence seemingly unshakable. That was until the day the Thunderbird came. The monstrous creature, a colossal bird with feathers as dark as the night sky, descended upon our village like a vengeful storm. It was said that the Thunderbird had been angered by a sacred artifact stolen from its nest, and now it sought retribution. As the tribe's most skilled warrior, I was chosen to confront the Thunderbird and return the stolen artifact to its rightful place. With a heavy heart, I embarked on my perilous journey, guided by the wisdom of our shaman and the spirits of my ancestors. As I drew closer to the Thunderbird's domain, I discovered a startling truth. The Thunderbird was not the true enemy of our people, but rather a powerful ally in a battle against a more sinister force, a malevolent shapeshifter that sought to destroy our tribe and claim the sacred artifact for itself. Realizing that I needed to change my strategy, I decided to manipulate the environment to my advantage. The shapeshifter thrived in darkness, so I would flood the area with light. If it relied on a specific element, I would remove or neutralize that element. The confrontation that followed was both harrowing and awe-inspiring. With the help of the Thunderbird, I illuminated the battlefield, forcing the shapeshifter to reveal its true form. We fought with all our might, the very fate of our people hanging in the balance. Despite our valiant efforts, we were unable to save my tribe from the shapeshifter's wrath. The village was left in ruins, and many of our people perished, but I knew that our fight had not been in vain. Our struggle against the shapeshifter would become a legend among our people, a tale of bravery and sacrifice that would inspire future generations. Though I was unable to save my tribe, I had become a symbol of courage and hope. The memory of my battle alongside the Thunderbird would live on in the hearts and minds of our people, a testament to the power of unity and determination in the face of adversity. And as the sun set on the remains of our village, I knew that our story would endure, a beacon of hope and strength for all who would come after us. For even in the darkest of times, the spirit of our people would always find a way to persevere. It was the time of our annual harvest festival in the village, a time when we came together to celebrate the bounty of the earth and the bonds of our community. Laughter filled the air, and the smell of delicious foods and the sounds of music and dance filled our hearts with joy. However, none of us could have anticipated the events that would soon unfold. 
During the height of the celebrations, an enigmatic stranger appeared in our midst. He was an odd figure, with a gleam in his eyes and an aura of mystery that captivated us all. Claiming to possess supernatural powers, he challenged the villagers to a game, promising to grant us extraordinary gifts if we could best him. Intrigued by the stranger's words, we eagerly accepted his challenge, unaware of the true nature of our opponent. As the game began, we soon discovered that the stranger was no ordinary man, but rather a cryptid known as the Trickster, a shape-shifting being that thrived on chaos and mischief. With each passing moment, the Trickster used his paranormal abilities to manipulate the villagers, turning us against one another and pushing our community to the brink of destruction. Friend turned against friend, and the bonds that had united us for generations began to unravel. In the midst of the chaos, our village's wise elder recognized the danger we were facing. She knew that the only way to save our community from ruin was to outwit the trickster and put an end to his malicious game. Drawing upon her knowledge of ancient lore and her own deep wisdom, she devised a plan to confront the cryptid and expose his true nature. The elder gathered the remaining villagers and shared her plan. We listened intently, understanding the gravity of the situation. In the importance of unity in the face of the trickster's deceptions, with renewed determination, we followed the elder's guidance and played the game using our wits and our trust in one another to resist the trickster's manipulations. Despite our best efforts, however, the trickster's power was too great. He wiped out the majority of our people, leaving only a small group of us standing. Realizing that he could no longer deceive us or sow chaos among us, the cryptid fled, vanishing into the shadows from which he had emerged, never to be found again. In the aftermath of the devastation, those of us who remained came together to rebuild our village and heal the wounds of the past. We mourned the loss of our loved ones and vowed to honor their memories by preserving the lessons we had learned. The story of the trickster would be passed down through the generations, a cautionary tale of the dangers of hubris and the importance of unity in the face of adversity. And though our village would never be the same, we held on to the hope that together we could face whatever challenges the future might hold. I'm currently 30, but was about 17 at this time. I was at a friend's house, two brothers. For the second or third time, deep country, hung out into the evening and night. The older one in my grade randomly brings up some bright light that shines around that isolated area. I didn't think much of it, but they seemed to be down for a little night adventure. We decided to roll a blunt and go sit out in some pasture or field. We sat around, talked, looked at the stars. I didn't even remember what they were talking about earlier. Suddenly everything I could see lit up like day for a fraction of a second. It was as if a digital camera three miles wide was hovering above us and just snapped a picture with the flash on. I remember seeing the hills in the distance, trees and cows here and there. It was over as soon as it started and we all looked at each other, confused. Our expressions all lead to the same reaction, and all of us run. We sprinted through pastures and helped each other through barbed wire fences, just scared. According to the two brothers, this was not a rare occurrence in Milheim, Texas. We're not friends anymore, in case anyone wonders why I use that context. I don't have a single clue as to what this was, just that it happened. Freaked me out and blew my mind. Had me feeling like a bacterium in a Petri dish for a moment. I've never heard of anything even somewhat related to this. It seems coincidental that I saw it the same day I was told about it. But that's how it happened. And no, I'm not talking about a spark or a light bulb. It was literally like clear daylight for about two, four seconds. Clear skies looking at the stars all night. No lightning or thunder. There was no sound to it. In 
In the small town of Crossland, Kentucky, humble people live simple lives and farm and sell goods to the bigger neighboring Perrier, Tennessee, and Murray, Kentucky, respectively. In the early 1960s, a man named Larry stumbled upon the snake. Unlike anything common to the area, it was 65 feet long by length and 6 feet by width. And in his words, well, I had thought it was a moonshine still, until it hissed at me. A sketch of the beast was drawn by his nephew perfectly to his description. It was emerald green with irregular brown splotches on its back and underbelly. Branching off from other snake species, it had a row of human-like teeth and fangs where its insecores would be. Small spikes lined across its back and head and ended off with a crest between its eyes. As the story spread, journalists from around the United States flocked to get a glimpse of the creature that scared the residents of Crossland. Hunters and trackers also attempted to catch the creature to no avail. In 1977, an expert snake hunter finally caught the beast, but it was revealed as a fake as the snake was less than half the size and actually from a circus, which was in the area at the time. During the era of the snake, Livestock and pets mysteriously disappeared with the only remaining evidence were bells, collars, and blood. The early 80s proved the end of the snake overturn as residents of Crossland, now part of Perrier, Tennessee, see part one, and their town have faded into obscurity. Before I end this off, this is 100% true. Crossland, Tennessee exists, and evidence of the snake hunt can be in many local newspapers from that time and region of the Tennessee's and Kentucky state line. As many wonder on and about the past terror of a monstrous snake, could it happen again in those deep, dense cornfields, the dark, dreary woods of the night, or the muddy, murky waters of the creeks and marshes? One thing is for sure, snake season is spring. As an ambitious archaeologist, I had always been captivated by the mysteries of the past, especially the stories of the long-lost Native American tribes. When I stumbled upon the ruins of one such tribe hidden deep within a dense forest, I knew I had made a monumental discovery. Among the artifacts I found was a set of ancient texts detailing their encounters with a mysterious and terrifying cryptid known as the Howling Wind. According to the texts, this creature was believed to control the weather and unleash devastating storm. I felt a mixture of excitement and trepidation as I continued my research, eager to unravel the secrets of this forgotten tribe. However, I could not foresee the consequences of my actions. By delving into the mysteries of the past, I had unknowingly unleashed the dormant spirits of the tribe's ancestors. Angered by the desecration of their sacred grounds, these spirits sought vengeance. In their quest for justice, the spirits summoned the howling wind to terrorize the nearby modern Native American community. Unrelenting storms ravaged the land, and the people were left in a state of fear and despair. Realizing the connection between my actions and the chaos that had befallen the community, I knew it was my responsibility to make amends. With the help of the community, we worked together to understand our ancestors' connection to the cryptid and find a way to bring peace to the land. We studied the ancient texts and discovered a possible solution. A gun filled with the poisonous blood of our ancestors, which was believed to have the power to defeat the howling wind, determined to end the suffering of the people. I ventured into the heart of the storm to confront the howling wind. The creature's fury was unlike anything I had ever experienced, but I held on to the hope that our ancestors' wisdom would guide us to victory. As the wind howled around me, I took aim and fired the gun the poisonous blood piercing the cryptid's ethereal form. The howling wind screams filled the air as its power began to wane and the storm finally subsided. The spirits of the ancestors, satisfied that their sacred grounds had been avenged, 
retreated into the realm of the past. With the chaos finally at an end, the community came together to rebuild and heal. We vowed to honor our ancestors by respecting the land and the ancient wisdom they had left behind. The story of the howling wind would live on as a reminder of the power of unity and the importance of understanding the past in order to protect our future. I never told this story to anybody but my daughter because I knew nobody would believe me. I don't even believe it. I worked at a video store back in the early 90s and this couple came up to the counter to pay for their movies. They were talking and the girl was saying, I know what I saw, it was a centaur. I was like, huh? Her friend said, you must have been drinking something or uh, on drugs. After they left, I was thinking the same thing. That girl was on something cause there's no such thing as a senator. Fast forward a couple of months, me and my boyfriend were going to a racetrack about an hour away from our town. We were making small conversation and I looked to the side of the road. The road we were on was known for deers and I was looking out. As I continued to look, I saw a man on a horse. And as we got closer, it wasn't a man on a horse, he was a part of the horse. I turned to my boyfriend and asked him, did he see it? He didn't, and I was not going to tell him what I saw, because he didn't believe in that sort of thing. I wondered if this was what the girl in the video store saw. I just can't believe what I saw. A centaur that's made up, right? A long time ago, before photos were relevant in Alaska, my ancestors lived in harmony with the little people. Yes, their next-door neighbors and shit. They lived like that for a while until one day, one of the dogs of the native people ate one of the little people's baby. As it had stumbled too close to the dog, food was scarce to try and keep every single dog pack well fed. The little people leader met with the native leader and suggested that they put down the dog and all would be forgiven. Mind you, this was the native's finest dog and was the leader for many years and he decided against it. Yes, I know it's kind of petty and I will never understand why he couldn't sacrifice one dog as great as he was and try and craft another leader to keep peace between the peoples. As you'd imagine, both sides split up, and it's been that way ever since. It does fascinate me how life would be so much different if the native leader complied with the deal. I do wonder how it would be to live with them time to time. Anyway, one winter night in cold-ass Alaska at around 5 a.m., I went outside to smoke a cigarette. It was unnervingly quiet and dark, as it usually is that time of night. I live in a really really, really small town that barely stretches across a mile long. Outside of my house, there is one LED light connected to an electric pole that's about a block or two away. There's never anyone out riding their machines or four-wheelers that time of night, and rarely ever is someone walking around, let alone running. I'm smoking my cigarette, and about halfway through, I saw it at the corner of my eye. At first, I thought it was someone taking a jog, but who would be jogging at 5 a.m. on a cold winter night? Not insulting my town, but no one runs here, lol. Not outside, at least. There are some white teachers who do run, but all the teachers were out of town, back with their families in their home state, as it was Christmas season. It was also snowing lightly. I turned to look and, oh... If the seven-foot mother F was just blasting down the street. I'm talking Usain Bolt shit going for that gold. I'm not really great at height perception, but I know he was at minimum six feet eight seven. But here's where it gets creepy. When you run, you move your arms right. It's just instinct, and I believe it does help you go faster with the right form. When I saw it, both arms were tucked on the side of his hips. No arms moving, but those legs were going at least 20, 25 miles per hour. I was surprised at this point, but then I noticed something else it was doing. 
It watched me as it ran by. I can see the parka rough outlines at the top of its body, facing towards me the whole time it was in sight. No arms moving, only legs, looking at me as it burned through the road. Now I did say there was a bright LED light a couple blocks away from my house, and it faces towards my place. But that didn't do any help in trying to scope out its facial features, especially since the light was on the side as it was running and completely on the other side of its face as it was looking towards me. I watched it go by as it just watched me also. It felt like an eternity, but really it was only about a 10-15 second encounter. Right behind it, a fox was chasing him, almost like it was its pet or something. Although it's widely known in the state big and little people have supernatural powers, one of which is being able to transform into an animal it chooses. So I really don't know if that was its buddy or its pet. I'll never know. As soon as both of them were out of my sight, I went further onto the porch to see where they went. My friend, when I told him about that part, said, what if it just turn around and run towards you when you do that? That made me realize how dumb I actually was trying to observe its whereabouts and that I never in a million years would go further onto the porch just to see it again. After I saw it had gone, I couldn't fathom what I just saw until later, but I noped the F back inside. Even my cigarette was unfinished. I didn't even put it in the cigarette container, just flew it across the yard LMAO. I went inside continued on like it never even happened. Went to sleep and I wouldn't talk about it for another year or so. I have no idea why, but when I did finally tell my said friend mentioned above, he immediately said the native word we have for tall people. A lot of my people choose to doubt me whenever I tell them about it, and it infuriates me because our culture has been involved with these kinds of beings for hundreds of years. We have a lot of folklore stories, but we also have a bunch of accounts based on true encounters. If you read up on supernatural beings in native Alaska, there are some horrific ones that will straight up scare the shit to you. This happened a long time ago, and I do think of it time and time again. Like why? Why did it do that to me, of all people? I always heard stories of my friends running into little people, and I never did saw them before. I would just be like, man, I wish I can run into a little person or something. Or something I recall saying that a bunch of times, it's possible that one of their supernatural powers could sense this. Like almost mocking me, this is what you wanted to see, huh? I wouldn't go out to places at night unless I had a ride because who knows what it would do if I saw it again. This went on for about a year, then I kind of just forgot about it, I guess. Nowadays, I can walk alone at night and be much less worrisome. I've done it countless times since then, and if it wanted to do something to me, it damn sure would by now. People tell me that they choose who can see them and who can't. Their stealth is unmatched, and only a select few can see the big and little people. That's why I wonder why me. Why did it choose to do that to me? Was it just to quench my thirst for the supernatural, telling me this shit is real? I'll never know. I'm certainly not going to ask it. This is one of my desert stories. They are all true, with the given disclaimer that I'm only human and have made mistakes in perception and judgment the same as the rest of us. I don't drink booze to more than a light buzz most of the time and have only blacked out one says early in my teens. I don't really me as with weed and avoid hallucinogens. Deserts are inherently kinda otherworldly places, even if you call one home. Dens in particular are very odd. I know of only a few places where you can find them in my part of the world. The northernmost are the Kilpecker Dunes in the Red Desert of southern Wyoming, then to the south, Great Sand Dunes National Park in Colorado, and further south, yet are the Dunes in White Sands National Park. Maybe there are others, but these are the ones I've been to many times. 
They are some of the few places where I feel reasonably comfortable practicing firecraft in dry seasons. They are an amazing place to learn about what you can and can't do without and to practice more esoteric bushcraft and survival skills. These three locations are also by amazing coincidence where these stories take place. I'll start here with the one I've been to the most. I grew up in a high desert. They are unforgiving by their very nature, but if you can take what they throw at you, they are full of a surprising amount of life and beauty. The forests and mountains may be my sanctuary, but I fear in my heart that I am ultimately a desert creature and the dry wind that steals away warmth and moisture also calls me home. I love the desert and the winds that allow nothing spare. I love the rocky creek beds where the bones of the fish that once gave them life blew them into dust centuries ago. I love the rocky outcrops rotted away to globular non, forms by wind and night. The desert is my home, much like any other home. Once you get used to its little tales, a sense of a place forms within you. You know when you're alone in it, when a cherished knick-knack has been moved a four left open. Sometimes the echoes of a missing familiar sound can whisper a warning, a slight sense of offness. Sometimes, though, they can scream. The dunes of the Red Desert are not easy to get to, and depending on which part you're in, entry can be of dubious legality. I, of course, of course, would never advise going where you aren't allowed, and certainly never have in my hastier, less cautious youth. No, sir. I'd been many times, and I tried to avoid camping or tooling around out there in the same spot. Alcohol was usually hauled out, water always was, and usually some lightweight means of defending oneself but there isn't exactly a plethora of prey animals to feed a huge predatory population, so it's not really all that necessary. Somewhere around a decade ago, maybe more, maybe less, I took something of an on-again, off-again girlfriend of mine, off-again girlfriend of mine out to the Red Dunes, hopefully for a, a night of fun, if not outright debauchery. The pretense, which she later happily confirmed was pretense for her as well, was that we were there to practice air-based water collecting techniques and firecraft. I've never been much of a smooth talker, but what can I say? Hope springs eternal. I won't use any real names, but I'll refer to her by the trade I most associate with her. So let's call her Grace. It was a drive and a half, but eventually we got there and in relative comfort. Like many young women in the Mountain West, parental worries of their daughters being stranded somewhere by buying them overbuilt sport utility vehicles is with all wheel drive and enough creature comforts to make you feel like you never left home at all. As they have the gas efficiency of a derrick fire, and Grace was nothing if not practical, she had yanked out half the seats and turned the inside into huge cargo space including a secondary gas tank. I understand that this is not necessarily safe if done by an amateur and is typically outside of the cab in a truck bed, but whatever. Not my vehicle. Anyway, this was good, as we burned a lot of gas to get out there and the all-wheel drive was very handy. We got there around the hottest part of the day, which in the early fall isn't so bad, and hiked out to where we wanted to set up camp. I had on occasion read about them before and decided to attempt a travoy with a couple of poles I had brought for the purpose. For the time expenditure of around 20 minutes of setup and the purpose of dragging crap along the sand, I gotta say, not bad. I was able to haul off. Of out BS out by myself around three, three and a half miles from where we parked. The dunes cover a truly huge space, and my favorite parts are, of course, the hardest to get to, as they tend to be the farthest from the adverse. I don't have an issue with them necessarily, but I like the dunes best when it's quiet enough to hear them sing. I don't understand it well enough to explain it. You'll have to look it up. They are what are known as living dunes, and they make a noise folks call singing. Of course, as a younger man trying, in a self-awarely stupid fashion, 
to impress my date with my muscles and trying to maintain a lively conversation without revealing how winded I was. Don't judge walking on shifting sands is hard. I wasn't listening for the singing of sand, but trying to kick. What Grace was saying over the wind. This story isn't about that part anyway, but I can say, even with something of a bittersweet taste in my mouth now, that it was a pleasant time with a person I once loved, and I wouldn't have traded it for the world. We set up our camp in the nook between a few dunes, erecting a virginal handmade tent of Grace's design and manufacture with some difficulty and good-natured swearing. It was pretty cool, a kind of low wedge designed to be erected in high wind zones and remain warm. It had a dead airspace built in, which was a pretty neat feature to my mind. Along with it, we discovered why a Dakota fire pit doesn't work well on shifting sands, which should have been obvious if either of us thought about it for more than a half second, and thoroughly chastised by the cruel dictates of basic physics, dug a regular fire pit like folks with functioning frontal lobes. We set up a few frames which held elevated tarps with stones in the middle over half-buried buckets to attempt to collect dew as well. I showed her the basics, and Grace lit her first friction fire with a willow bough drill, a cottonwood baseboard, and yucca stalk spindle. This is my go-to combo in the western steppe, by the way, in only a few tries. As the pre-dusk light show that descends every evening, known to the natives as golden hour. Probably to everybody, for all I know, rolled across the dunes and mountains of the Red Desert like so much maple syrup over harsh and unusually topographically variable pancakes, Grace and I were letting some stew cook over the fire while I showed her how to process yucca for fiber. We had a very pleasant evening characterized by not enough stew and too much whiskey in a song I wrote. Very much not for her, except in the fact that it very much was, accompanied by one of those horrible little broom-shaped traveling guitars. As is the way of the fortunes of all young men trying to impress women who they should know, have them dead to rights already, the B-string broke halfway through. If you can't make the object of your affection swoon, making them laugh their asses off isn't a bad consolation prize. We ended the night wrapped in a blanket by the fire, watching the moon rise and the stars do their gentle revolving dance around Polaris until I carried her, snoring like Ban saw, into her sleeping bag. I settled into mine and let the sound of the wind and the singing dunes carry me to sleep. As an aside, folks who might still benefit from this advice, take time to remind yourself to remember moments like these as they happen. They are gifts, and they should be treasured as such. I rested comfortably for a while, maybe an hour or two, before the whiskey reminded me of the debt I now owed it, and I went to relieve myself. I was immediately taken aback by two things. One was the ludicrous brightness of the moon, despite the residing in the red. Desert, the Kilpecker dunes, are in fact a kind of creamy tan color, and on nights with a full moon, you might find darker conditions under a storm cloud in the middle of the day. The light seemed like it was pulsing a little, which I assume was probably more to do with dehydration and booze than the actual light sources. The second thing I noticed was the calm. It's almost always windy in Wyoming. It just is. I grew up there, walking to school in steady 40 miles per hour winds. Calm does happen, but it's usually a relative calm, like only eight miles per hour winds. This was still. Waking up to the calm is like waking up in a strange room you don't remember falling asleep in. Not inherently bad, per se, but disquieting and alien in a small but pervasive way. I climbed up a nearby dune, because if I have to urinate, I may as well do so from a great height. The men reading this will understand, and because I wanted a good view of the surrounding area under its unusually well-illuminated condition. The only sound was my footsteps, my breath, and the gentle hum of the dunes themselves. Not even an owl to be heard, 
As I got to the top, a mountain came into view. Actually, several did. This isn't an unusual experience in the Rockies, as visibility can often be hundreds of miles in clear conditions and farther from elevation. What was of note was that above the wands to the north of me, there were flashes and flickers of light. The thunderstorm up north was my first thought, which would have been the safe bet, but I saw no clouds past them. I then noticed the ghostly colors of the lights and realized I was watching the aurora borealis, which I was hitherto unaware could be seen from that far south. I took a moment to relax and enjoy it before scanning around me to see what other sights the moon would show me. It was then that I spotted, down below me in a flatter area, what appeared to be many numerous four-legged creatures, cows, sheep, antelope, hell, even deer or elk wouldn't be that strain. I honestly couldn't tell you what they were, only that where were probably more than twenty and less than fifty. More about that in a moment, but in the middle, I swore I saw an old school, I kid you not, covered wagon. Not the pioneer kind, but the blockier, fully roofed shepherd's hut, on wheels that dotted Wyoming like freckles, a hundred and twenty years ago. Folks think it was the cattle that built the West, but Wyoming, first and foremost, was built on sheep. However, whatever I was seeing, it was all backlit by the moon, so they were casting shadows from the side facing me. Now, I'll be honest with y'all, I, I don't have the absolutely clearest vision. It's not bad, better with glasses, but I don't usually bring them with me to throw a leak in the middle of the night. So when I say the movement of these critters and the wagon look strange, almost flickery, I expect you to take it with a grain of salt. I expect you to say it had something to do with the aurora or my eyes being tired, and those are all legit. Thankfully, I have really good hearing and olfactory perception. What my mediocre vision doesn't explain is why I was looking at something probably less than a mile away, and I couldn't hear it on a still night. Wagons are noisy. They creak worse than boats, even when new. Livestock are noisy, and I'd find it odd to see a group that size with no bells around their necks. Nothing. Silence. Furthermore, why would you try to travel by night? It was bright, sure, but it's not like that's a common practice, at least not according to anything I've ever heard. You want your critters together and easily defended from predators. That's what I understand. I watched them for a while, moving slowly across the ground almost like they were underwater. Slow enough I broke off a yucca stock and stuck it into the ground to mark the progress. Slow, but it was there. I stayed up there watching the lights and the procession of shadows for a long time. Eventually, I decided to whistle at them. The two fingers in the mouth, super loud, angry dad, whistled. I heard it echo back at me and then nothing. I yelled a loud hello at them as well. Echo and nothing again. Huh? No change in pace. No lights. I started to think the progress might be the moon moving across the sky and not whatever I thought it was. So I decided to go grab my binoculars and try to wake up Grace to at least see the lights. It was a little treacherous descending, but I made it in one piece. Camp was as I had left it, and I relaxed a little. I opened the tent flap and dug around a little. Found my knocks but my etmeps to rouse my lady friend were unsuccessful. She was not having it. Not at all. She rolled over and went back to sleep and chastised. I went back up to the top of the dune. It took me a little longer this time. I was definitely feeling the climb by the time I got to the crest again. It looked like a little progress had been made, according to my yucca stalk markers. Curious as hell, I decided to use the binoculars to try to make out what I was looking at. I couldn't find the shadows in the binoculars. There are two possible influences on that. One being these were old binoculars, and they had been stuck in maximum zoom since I had gotten them. The other would be it was in the wee hours of the morning, and I had several hours earlier imbibed some booze. But try and try again. Nothing. I couldn't get eyes on the critters or the wagon. Couldn't hear them. 
Couldn't get a long-distance look at them. What was I to do? I said of it and went back to bed. Whatever I was looking at wasn't hurting me. It was just curious, and I had grown drowsy and cold, lying on the cold sand. I narked the direction with one of the stalk segments, slid down the dune on my ass, and crawled back into the tent. As I lay there, waiting for sleep in the warm and dark, I heard that gentle din noise again, and the wind picked back up. My lullaby. Just as I was drifting off, though, I thought I heard a whistle echo across the sands, but from very far away. I put it in to my ears, playing tricks on me, and when I next opened my eyes, it was morning. Problem was, I was sitting next to the still crackling fire, not in the tent and Grace was leaning against me as we sat wrapped in a blanket. I know, I know. If you, this was just a dream, you dee. I can hear you just fine. There are a few problems with that hypothesis, though. One was I put out the fire before going to bed. I'm camping in a giant ashtray with a shovel in hand. It was effortless to put out, and I remembered doing so very clearly. Another was that I was wearing shoes, which I hadn't done to go relieve myself, and I hadn't done since we started the fire the night before, since I wanted a better grip on my baseboard to show grace how to light a fire with a stick and bow. I have monkey feet judge away. Here's another. I could see my footsteps up the dune and the trail from my impromptu derriere, sledding session. Okay. I woke Grace up, and she said that she thought we had slept in the tent. I concurred, and we sat there blearily blinking at a fire we didn't remember building. I asked her to start the coffee and climb back up the dune, this time with my compass and my binocular. My yucca fragments were there, and I got a heading, scoping out where I thought they were the night before. Still didn't see anything that would have made sense. So I headed back down once more on the Achik Express and talked to my girlfriend about what I had seen. She wasn't particularly freaked out by any of it, confidently told me I was still asleep or sleepwalking when I saw lights in the bizarre caravan. She was a little concerned by the lost time and not remembering getting up, but I, I think to her credit as a reasonable person, she thought I was winding her up. I wasn't offended. I was, however, racked by curiosity. What the hell had happened? I'm not a sleepwalker as far as I know, and I, as I am now, writing this, have lost time before out in the wilderness, but never before this incident. Was it just weird shadows? Had I been asleep? My markers were there, so I had been pretty lucid for someone. One simple test I thought of would confirm or deny it, I decided to throw on my boots and hike over to where I thought the trail should be by my best guess, while I let Grace do her morning routines. A short, brisk walk later, and I found nothing. No prints of any kind. This part wasn't as sandy as some others, so prints wouldn't have been everywhere, but there were not. Likelihood of sleep and booze-fueled hallucinations increasing. I did a fairly thorough purge of a few hundred yards in several directions, leaving my water bottle as a guide for where I thought it should be. No prints. I didn't give up. I trust my senses most of the time, and I'm stubborn. Also, I wasn't seeing anything that, given the angle of the moon, should have cast a shadow like that. Scrub. Low brush. No trees, no boulders. I kept looking first along the route I thought they would have cone from. No prints again. Something to catch my eye, though. In a less sandy patch, I saw a long stretch of depressed clay. A rut, I realized, and some mild depressions in the rock here and there. A rut from a wheel made of something harder than modern tires with a less gentle suspension. Now that I was looking for it, I saw more here and there. Headed to bisect the dunes from one grassland to the next. Just an old, old trail from long ago. I don't know what any of that was. I wasn't of sober or clear mind, although I was far from... Blackout drunk or sleep deprived, Grace got angry at me after a certain point of talking about it, so I stopped bringing it up. We finished out our outing. 
Our water collectors were successful in that they collected dew and unsuccessful in that it was about a cup and a half from the three of them together. We made a bolo out of some rocks and yucca cordage pre-made its uh, process and what we had made while we were there was minimal and strictly as a tutorial. We practiced at ladle skills, ruined some perfectly good flint in the attempt to make a pair of blades. We shared many good meals together. Still overall a very pleasant trip. After another couple of uneventful nights we headed home. I hadn't discussed it with anyone since really. I have no good explanation. I have, however, been out there again, and while I've never seen anything like that again, twice in my recollection, I whistled at the top of the dunes before going to bed, and later that night, I was sure I heard one back. Probably just another camper. Probably. I've spent years hunting in the wilderness, but nothing could have prepared me for the swamps of Louisiana. Local hunters had been disappearing, vanishing into thin air, and it was my team's job to find out why. We were confident, even cocky, assured that our skills and experience would see us through, how wrong we were. The bayou was like another world, a maze of stagnant water and twisted trees draped with Spanish moss. The air was heavy, the silence only broken by the occasional croak of a bullfrog or the splash of unseen creatures beneath the murky water. We began our search for the missing hunters, unaware that we were heading into the lair of something unimaginable. We found the first sign on the third day, a boot half sunk in the mud, still warm. It belonged to one of the missing hunters. That's when we felt it for the first time, a prickle on the back of our necks, the sense of being watched. As we delved deeper into the swamp, that feeling grew stronger. It was on the fifth day that we finally saw it, a creature, massive and terrifying, its eyes glinting in the dim light. It was like nothing I'd ever seen before, a grotesque combination of reptile and mammal covered in thick, mottled scales. It moved with a surprising speed, disappearing into the undergrowth before we could react. The game had changed. We were no longer the hunters. We were the hunted. Our numbers dwindled as the creature picked us off one by one, our weapons seeming to have no effect on it. It was a nightmare, a waking nightmare, and the swamp was its domain. In the end, it was just me and the creature. I could see it circling me its eyes glowing in the darkness. I knew it was my due, or die moment. I had to face this monster and put an end to the terror it had unleashed upon the swamps. Adrenaline coursed through my veins as I steadied my rifle, taking aim at the creature's menacing eyes. It lunged at me, its jaws wide open, and I pulled the trigger. The shot rang out, and the creature let out an unearthly screech before collapsing to the ground. I cautiously approached its fallen body, my heart pounding, my breath ragged. It lay there, motionless, its twisted, grotesque form, a testament to the terror it had wrought. I'd done it. I'd killed the creature, avenged my fallen comrades, and put an end to the nightmare. But as I reached out to touch its scaly hide, the unimaginable happened. The creature's body began to fade, like mist dissipating in the morning sun. Within moments it was gone, leaving me standing in the swamp, wildered and alone. I searched the area, desperate to find some trace of the creature I'd just slain, but there was nothing. No blood, no tracks, no body. It was as if it had never existed. I returned home, haunted by the events in the swamp. My friends and family listened to my tale with disbelief, but I swore it was the truth. I knew what I'd seen, what I'd fought, and what I'd killed. But without the body, I had no proof. The swamps had swallowed the creature, just as they had swallowed the missing hunters. The mystery of the Louisiana swamps remained unsolved, and I was left with the chilling knowledge that somewhere out there the creature might still be lurking waiting for its next victim. A friend and I saw something several years back. 
It was very thin, and its skin looked as if it had a full-body latex suit on. Very shiny, bone structure in its face, but no eyes or orifices. You could see the ribs. Head was elongated, and fingers long and pointy. Had a peculiar-looking gait to it. This was late at night, and the creature was directly under a security light in my friend's backyard. We had been sitting quietly in his truck. This thing walked up, not noticing us. Maybe fifteen feet in front of us, directly under the security light, my friend screamed, and it jumped and faced us. It then took off towards the woods. We had been gone for a while and just sitting in the driveway, chilling before we went in. We had actually pushed the truck to the house because we had ran out of gas, right before we got back to his house. We finally got brave enough to run into the house, but the door was locked and he didn't have a key because he never locked the house. Then we go around the house to try to get through his bedroom window, only to find that it was open. Not only was it open, but the screen was wadded up and shredded on the ground. Anyone have any idea what this thing could have been? This was in 1996 or 97. I've never been able to figure it out. Late last night, my daughter, 21, her friend, 21, and I, 43, had spent the evening at a drag show in Galveston, Texas. After the show, we decided to drive down to the beach for a few minutes before we headed home. The beach we usually go to was kind of a far drive from where we were, and it was almost 3 a.m., so we decided to pull into a beach access that we had never been to before. I pulled in and drove around in a circle to shine the headlights in a 360 so we could kind of scope out the area before we got out. I parked next to a trash can, kind of close to the dunes. As soon as we got out of the car, I felt a heaviness, hard to explain. Just something felt weird, and my intuition was to get back in the car immediately and leave. I wish I would have. I didn't find out until later that my daughter and her friend had the same feeling. There was no moon, so the only light was from a few beach houses on the other side of the dunes. I keep a huge button flashlight slash taser in my car, so I grabbed it and we walked down to the water. Suddenly, out of the corner of my eye, I saw my daughter's friend turn around really fast and look back towards the car. She had heard a sound coming from the direction of the dunes. She grabbed my flashlight and pointed it towards my car, and she and I both saw something standing right up against my car. Neither of us were exactly sure of what we were looking at, because it seemed to fade away when the flashlight hit it. It's so hard to describe, but it was like you could only see it in the edge of the light from the flashlight. Like it only existed between light and dark, I grabbed the flashlight back and shined it directly where it was standing, and it was gone just kind of disappeared. It was very surreal. This heaviness that I felt when we first got there was suddenly unbearable, and we all knew we had to leave as quickly as possible, but we were all kind of frozen in fear. We slowly made our way back to the car, but as we got close, my daughter and her friend saw the same figure crouch down next to the trash can with its back facing them. It was eerily silent as we ran to the car, jumped in, and sped off. It was complete silence in the car for a few minutes until we got down the road a bit. Then I asked if they wanted to talk about what we just saw, and we all just collectively freaked the absolute F out, tears, and everything. My daughter only saw it from the front for a split second, but her friend and I looked directly at it, and we both described exactly the same thing. Judging by the height of my car, we estimated it to be at least six feet two, six feet five. It was very tall and slim. It had a human shape, but the face was just kind of blank with two black spaces where eyes should be, like the eyes were there, just really sunk in. Its face kind of had the shape of a long Gandalf-type beard, but it was fleshy, not hair. It had really long arms, one of which was resting on the top of my car, on the back passenger door. It seemed to be wearing what looked like a robe, but it was part of the creature, like his flesh was in the shape of long robe sleeves. 
No hands, just long, fleshy flaps. It was just standing there, kind of slouching, like it wasn't standing up all the way. And it just stared blankly at us, almost through us. When I say a heavy feeling, we could physically feel some sort of presence as soon as we had gotten there. I personally have never felt so much anxiety, fear, and terror in my life. I have no idea what the F we saw, but there is definitely a lingering, wary feeling through my whole body since it happened that I can't seem to shake. My daughter says she feels the same way. Every time we talk about it, we get chills. I'm super bad at drawing, but I tried my best to draw what I saw. I was with my friend I'm going to call Bane, going through the woods. Now let me trace back a little. This was in this big forest that stretches for miles with an entrance around the block from where I used to live. I saw and heard all kinds of scary phenomena in that woods. One time I was walking through with band, and when you first get into the woods, there's a path to the right that's blocked off by a fallen tree. If you go to the left, there's a little left there's a little hill that goes down now. There's two paths to go. The one on the left leads to a forest with denser trees, and the one on the right has the same trees all the way through. If you go to the right, there's two more really long paths, probably about a three or four minute walk, but you can still see to the end, one on the left. And on the right, the time before I heard a baby crying coming from the left. I didn't even get to go deep into the woods this time to be scared out. I thought I was tripping. At first, I thought it was the tree, and my eyes were playing tricks on me. But I squinted my eyes and saw whatever this was was really moving, and the reason I thought it was a tree was because I could see through him. It was a man wearing a brown hooded cloak or robe. He was transparent, walking left to right, faster than humanly possible, but it would only walk two or three feet before turning around and just doing it repeatedly. I ran out fast as heck, LOL. Anyways, about the Wahila, it's a big giant white wolf, kinda like the Wendigo. It can shapeshift, but the white wolf is the main form. One time I went down the left path and out of nowhere, from the right I see a giant white wolf. It jumped out from a bush and made not a single noise, but this creature is said to kill. It hopped back into the bush and just disappeared. It didn't even scare me. Whatever this was gave me vibes of goods of good like it was looking out for me or protecting me because I mean it didn't attack me. Except my friend didn't see the same thing I saw. After we had run out, he told me he saw a giant white creature standing there on two legs. I told him what I saw and he dismissed it telling me what he saw. So we saw two different things. Was it a Wahila or do y'all think it could have been something else? What do y'all think the brown-robed man was? I need names for these cryptids or phenomena because I need some kind of explanation. Last Saturday, the 17th of December, at around midnight on Industrial Ard, near where I live in Moriah, Pennsylvania, my sister and son were driving back from dinner and shopping. They both saw a jet-black, upright, wolf-like creature the size of an outhouse, eight-plus feet tall, run across the road in front of them. My son said the moon was bright and three inches of snow were on the ground. He said it looked human, like. He also states that it moved extremely fast as it ran across the road in front of them. This is a road located about one mile from Frackville, Pennsylvania, and nearly two miles from Moore, Pennsylvania. My son said that it howled. Thought you should know. As a seasoned hunter, I've heard countless tales and accounts from my peers, but none were as chilling as the one I discovered in the dense Amazon rainforest. I found a diary belonging to a fellow hunter, a man who met his end in an encounter with a creature of the shadows. Here is his story as he penned it. Day one, I've made it to the heart of the Amazon. I'm here. 
not for the jaguars or the anacondas, but for something far more elusive. The locals speak in hushed whispers of a creature that melds with the shadows, a phantom that has claimed many lives. I intend to track it down, to bring it to light. Day five, I've seen it, just a glimpse, a flicker in the corner of my eye, but I know it was the creature. It was like a living shadow, fluid and quick. The jungle has become a game of cat and mouse, with me as the mouse. Day seven, the creature is not just elusive, it's deadly. I found the remains of a jaguar today, torn apart with a violence that made my blood run cold. I've hunted many predators, but this creature, it's something else. Day 10. I've realized that to survive, I need to outsmart the creature. I must use everything I know about the jungle, turn its traps against it. I've set snares and pitfalls, hoping to catch it off guard. Day 15. I can feel it closing in. The shadows seem darker, the silence more oppressive. I know it's watching, waiting. But I'm ready. If it's my fate to die in this jungle, I'll make sure I don't go down without a fight. That was the last entry in the diary. I found it next to a makeshift camp, the ground torn up and stained with old blood. The hunter didn't survive, but his story did. His words serve as a stark reminder of the dangers that lurk in the shadows of the Amazon and the creatures that are better left undiscovered. So to begin, this story happened back in 2018. I arrived in this small rural town near Cape May, in New Jersey. The company I was working for at the time was sending me out to go door to door advertising cable and Wi-Fi that they wanted me to sell. I was getting weird vibes all throughout the day as the town itself was very small and a bit creepy with people staring at me or giving me the cold shoulder for the entire day. It seemed like a lot of the townsfolk that I encountered that day were on edge and it was a weird, tense atmosphere that I shrugged off as people are weird all the time. I continued doing my job, chugging a Red Bull to keep me going, which didn't affect me at all surprisingly. Besides the weird atmosphere, the scenery was actually quite pretty once you got off the main road. I had to stop at different streets, and some were in the woods on long and seemingly beautiful endless road. It was quite scenic, just before sunset. I was scheduled to visit a few houses on a small peninsula. To get to this peninsula, you had to go down a very long road, past a summer camp area, past a trailer park, past the woods, and then you finally find yourself in a small open area with a bay marsh, a couple small expensive houses, and shore access. The houses were so close to the water it seemed to be a code violation, but I'm sure they were built to withstand storms since they looked so expensive. Every house had its own meme, and the area was mostly deserted. Only one house had someone inside whom I had talked to after knocking on his door. I was so distracted looking at the houses and scenery that I didn't notice how fast sunset was approaching. I came to the realization that I should start heading back to avoid being alone on that long deserted pathway in the woods. As a smaller female, I'm never comfortable after dark in isolated places, especially without cell service. I was making my way down the path, so far so good, as it wasn't completely dark yet. As I approached the wooded area of the road, I was walking a bit faster, since there were no street lights and the sunlight was rapidly disappearing. As I walked at a decently fast pace, I noticed something. The woods were eerily quiet. All the life that I was hearing before was gone. No crickets, no birds. Just pure silence. I stopped in my tracks and got chills down my spine as I felt the feeling that I was being watched. I looked around the dark woods for any sudden movements and then, like clockwork, something up ahead made its way out of the tree line. It looked to be some type of large animal. My brain went into overdrive, analyzing whatever this animal was. Was it a bear? A dog? No. It looked like a large dog. But dogs don't get this big. Though I was intimidated by its large size, whatever it was hadn't noticed me. 
Even though I was scared, I also didn't want to walk back and go into that one man's house. As a woman, I would rather take my chances with a wild animal than be alone with a man I don't know in a deserted holiday neighborhood. Suddenly, as I was thinking this, the large animal in the distance finally noticed my presence. It was observing me, not entirely sure of what to do with me. There wasn't enough light anymore for me to see the animal's face, but I felt unusually frightened. Whatever I was looking at was definitely too big to be a black bear with a shoulder height of at least five feet on all fours, which is comparable in size to a brown bear. The mass of this creature was extensive, as the outline of what I could see looked like a wolf on steroids. It was very muscular. I also noticed that the outline of its face was very similar to that of a German shepherd or a wolf as it had perked ears and a long snap. In the heat of the moment I could only hear the sound of my heart palpitating as fear and adrenaline started to crawl their way into my bloodstream. It felt as if time stood still and then it dawned on me. What I was looking at wasn't a normal animal, and it was simply too big to be any animal that I could recognize from New Jersey's catalog of fauna. And if it wanted to attack me, I would be powerless against it. It was simply too big. Though, to calm myself down, I threw the idea that this creature was out of the ordinary out, because I felt like this could be rationalized somehow. I made my brain go back to the idea of this being maybe a large dog or a coyote. I also did not believe in cryptids and was completely unaware of what size coyotes are supposed to be, so I made a quick decision. Realizing that this could very well be a life or death situation, I came to the conclusion that this very large dog-like creature was probably a skittish coyote that I could scare off at least temporarily, to calm down my nerves. What other choice did I have? The longer I kept standing there, the more aggressive I might come across to this animal, and I didn't want it to get territorial or get the idea that I was easy prey. So I decided I would make the most hideous, loud, confusing, and startling scream howl I could muster and just print the rest of the way. After I screeched this hideous sound out of my body as hard as I could, the animal quickly changed its body language to defensive, but then it quickly changed its mind to deciding I wasn't worth a fight as it ran a decent distance into the woods. Not too far, though. I decided to sprint as fast as I could pass that area and beyond. I sprinted until I reached the end of the road and noticed there was a summer camp area with street lights near me. I rested on top of a table there, out of breath and feeling my heart pound out of my chest. However, I was still very shaken up and still felt like I was being watched. I kept my eyes on the tree line. My eyes were darting around, looking for any sign this animal was still there. Once I felt like the coast was clear, I located the next house I was scheduled to visit, and I quickly made my way over. I met a nice family who ended up buying cable from me, and I told them what had happened to me that night and how I was treated by the local. The lady of the family, who I presume to be the mother, said I don't know why they sent you out here alone. These woods are dangerous after dark, and there are creepy people who live around here. The impression she was giving me was that there were animal encounters she couldn't explain, and that there were lots of ex-convicts in the area, and people who should have been arrested but haven't been. She was equally concerned about the people as she was about the animals around this place. This gave me goosebumps. How many times today could my life have been taken? They were extremely concerned for my safety and told me to contact my team leader so I could get picked up. They said they didn't want me to go outside again and that I should call it quits for the night and not make it to any other houses. To this day, I still have no idea what creature I had encountered. There are strange things in the woods, things people don't speak about or cover up. I felt like the townsfolk of that town knew something about what I encountered. So weird creature I encountered in those woods. Let's never meet again.
I grew up in rural British Columbia. One time, my parents and I were out in the middle of nowhere picking Saskatoon berries on the side of the highway. My dad had gone further into the woods to take a leak or maybe to find a better spot, I guess. This guy in a shiny black car pulled over and started talking to my mom and I. I remember he was very charming, wearing really nice clothes with his hair slicked back. I'm from a small town where people wear plaid and camo together, so this seemed weird. The guy asked us about what we were picking, then said he had berries too and offered us some. Later I thought that was weird because it was just a regular grocery store carton of blackberries. He kept chatting for a bit, more talking at us than with us. My mom, I think, was trying to be polite. But when my dad came back, the guy just messed right off. I hadn't thought about this for years, but thinking back, that is creepy as hell. If the guy didn't have some ulterior motive, then why would he drive away so fast? I mean, either way, if he was just trying to flirt with my mom, the middle of nowhere is not really the best place to do that. This is more my sister's story since I slept through the whole thing. Her boyfriend lived three doors down. She was coming home late one night and noticed the garage door was open. She thought Dad left it open. He's forgetful like that. But then, as she approached, she could see the door leading to the house from the garage was ajar. That doctor slammed shut automatically. It's like on a spring or something. She ran back to her boyfriend's place, thinking we're getting robbed. He grabbed his baseball bat and started towards the house. Why he didn't just call the cops right away? I don't know. Let's blame the teenage hormones. He was nearly at the house when a man comes out of the garage and sees him. He bolts between the two houses. He would have had to hop the two tall fences to clear the yard and get to the wooded ravine behind our house. He did it fast. They woke my parents, who had enough sense to call the cops. They came and investigated, but the guy was long gone. Turns out he had used my shoe to pry the house door open. Nothing was missing. Me and my parents were in the house sleeping while he just snooped, maybe watched. I slept through the whole thing. Cops and all. Sis told me about it the next day. Fast forward a couple years later. A successful army pilot is arrested for murder. This guy was a pilot for our prime minister, Canada. He started with breaking and entering in our part of town. No stealing, just snooping. He lived one neighborhood over. He eventually escalated and was caught. I'm convinced it was him. If my sister had been 15 minutes earlier, who knows what he would have done if he was caught in the act. In Wyoming, my co-worker and I were doing a survey miles from any road or property, and I spotted a couple of big rocks that had been laid against another rock jutting out of a hill. This made a small cave shelter big enough for a person to lay down in. I walked around the other side of it to see inside. It was blocked with a tarp, but I could see some bags and boots in there. After taking some pictures prior to disturbing anything, I removed the tarp and found in a frame backpack, pink hiking boots, and a black duffel bag. The A-frame backpack had nothing inside, and neither did the hiking boots. The black duffel bag had a big black jacket directly inside, probably to protect what was underneath. Under that was an old early 2000s laptop and charger and an early 2000s camcorder in a name pocket. Underneath that was a bunch of camcorder tapes labeled things like 2013 stories and New York experiments. Then came a yellow folder full of letters to various people and a shit ton of driver's licenses. I didn't look at all of them, but they were all of different people, and the oldest I saw was a CIA license from 1976. At this point, I'm kind of scared, but also there are two zippered pockets remaining on the duffel. One on the right and one on the left. The right pocket held more letters and licenses crammed into the pocket. I moved those aside and found a hockey mask, like a Jason horror movie hockey mask. 
The left pocket held a black ski mask complete with eye holes and a mouth cut out. Inside the mask was a smartphone and charger. Underneath all of that, a nine Glock and boxes of bullets. Frightened my co-worker and I hiked until we got service and called the land agency law enforcement. I was rather nervous I was going to get in trouble for disturbing a crime scene or something, but they seemed very bored by the whole thing. The next day we hiked out with law enforcement to show them the whole thing. I put everything back before leaving, and they boxed it up, thanked me, and said, well, this is the weirdest thing I've seen. This was less than a year ago, and I really want to know what happened with it all. I had a bizarre experience about two years ago near the Three Sisters Mountains of the Mackenzie River area in central Cascades of Oregon. I was camped at a lake we had packed to, next to a closed Boy Scout of America campsite. We were definitely alone as we had special permission to be there from the Boy Scout of America and it was off-season. It was in May and the snow had finally cleared in most spots and the weather was warming up. Anyway, at dusk, there was a long series of high-pitched, gruff, buzzing whistles that we heard adjacent to camp. We had camped close to shore, bellow a rise that overlooked the lake in our camp. The sound echoed around the lake and were fairly loud. Only three of the six of us heard it. It moved slowly along the bluff back and forth for about 45 minutes. A friend and I went to see what it was, and it would move off away from us as we would get closer to the source. It stopped shortly after dark, however it resumed at dawn and got very close to camp. When we felt comfortable to investigate, there was no sign of any kind along the animal trail that traversed the ridge. There was a cross path that cut through a thicket that had been recently used by animals. We are all veteran hunters, trackers, and woodsmen, and none who heard it could say what it was. It definitely wasn't elk, frogs, or crickets. It was unlike anything we had heard previous or since. Does anyone know of any reported sightings in that area from 1998 or 99? How about any known bird or animals that would make this sound? I am trying to remain objective about this and not brand it a Bigfoot encounter and have been thinking about it for the last two years. My name is Kirk. Me and my fiancé, Sean, were camping up off of Ben Smith Road, August 1-2, 1998. Sunday the 2nd, we packed up camp by noon and headed down to the Wilson River to cool off a bit. It was very hot. We drove down off of Ben Smith Road, going east on the Flats Road that follows the river. We crossed the river to lay in the sun. We were there for 10-15 minutes when I saw someone or something down river about 45-50 yards, swaying back and forth with its head down the whole tank, while also moving up and down river with no problem at all. I didn't think much of it at first, but when Sean got up and moved to the middle of the river, it spotted us, froze, and then glared at us. Then I moved to the middle and didn't take my eyes off of it. It moved to the right of the river in some bushes, somewhat hiding, it seemed like. Then I knew something wasn't right. It had big hair and long arms. It didn't act human-like at all. I couldn't make out a face, just eye socket. I wondered what it was wearing winter clothes for when it was 90 degrees outside. They were not clothes. It had reddish, blonde-like hair and was about six feet tall. I have hunted and fished up at Lee's camp for years and have never seen anything like it before. After we got home that night, we talked about it more, leaving us with a strange feeling. We know what it was now, a female yeti. The sun was setting as I patrolled the deep woods near the Grand Canyon. I'm park ranger Jane and the silence was broken only by the sounds of rustling leaves, the occasional chirping of a bird. I was well versed in the local wildlife and the legends that surrounded the area. However, nothing could have prepared me for what I was about to encounter. 
As I walked along the trail, I felt an inexplicable sense of unease. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end, and a shiver ran down my spine. I had heard stories about the Wendigo, a terrifying creature said to roam these woods, but I had always dismissed them as folklore. Suddenly I heard a guttural growl from behind me. I whirled around, only to find myself face to face with the Wendigo itself. Its gaunt figure towered above me, antlers protruding from its skull-like head. Its eyes were dark and filled with an insatiable hunger. I was frozen with terror, unable to move or even scream. In the blink of an eye, the Wendigo lunged at me, tackling me to the ground. The force of the impact knocked the wind out of me, and I struggled to catch my breath. I could feel its rancid breath on my face as it leaned in closer, ready to claim its next victim. But just as quickly as it had appeared, the Wendigo vanished. It seemed to dissolve into the shadows, leaving me alone and terrified on the forest floor. I scrambled to my feet, my heart pounding in my chest, and grabbed my radio. I desperately called in my colleagues, my voice shaky as I recounted the attack. They rushed to my aid, but when they arrived, there was no sign of the Wendigo. I could see the skepticism in their eyes as they listened to my story. Despite the very real terror I had experienced, they dismissed it as nothing more than an overactive imagination. Determined to prove the existence of the Wendigo, I led my colleagues deeper into the woods, hoping to find some evidence of the creature. We searched for hours, but found nothing. No tracks, no broken branches, no signs of a struggle. As night fell, we reluctantly returned to the ranger station, my colleagues still unconvinced. I knew what I had seen, and I knew that the Wendigo was still out there, lurking in the shadows. I vowed to continue my search, to prove the existence of the creature and ensure the safety of the people who ventured into the deep woods near the Grand Canyon. But as the days turned into weeks and the weeks into months, my resolve wavered. The Wendigo remained elusive of its presence haunting my every waking moment. I could not forget the chilling encounter, and I could not escape the nagging feeling that the Wendigo was still watching me, waiting for the perfect moment to strike again. In these hills and hollows, I'm not surprised often. You fall into a rhythm here. The longer you spend, the less things you see or hear around truly surprises you. One animal that always surprises me is a cat. I was nine when I realized that my mom's barn cat always ate the heads first on mice. I was eleven when I realized all cats do that, big and small. I was walking up the headwaters of a tributary of Elk River. Elk River is a wild stream. It boils, rolls, and digs deep the holes that incur the full wrath of that river. The streams that feed the elk are steep, fast, and cold most of the year, but in August everything heats up. Big trout escape the warming water by sneaking up any small streams, not dried up, and eat any fish or creature they can fit it in their gullet. Seriously, I caught a brown just over twenty yard, half a mile up a gully, in a stream you could stand on both sides. But I digress. Me and a friend used to catch a ride with his older brother, a log truck driver, he would drop us off at one of those tributaries in the morning and pick us back up on his last trip of the evening. Only thing he would tell us, watch out for rattlers and have you ass beside the road at five or you walk in a slaty. So with a sack lunch and fishing poles, we would take off into the shadowy hollers. Me and Nub was leapfrogging up this long rocky creek, catching brookies in every hole. Fishing towards lunchtime at the head of the stream, I got a little away from Nub in a long, steep stretch of unfishable white water leading up to a set of falls. As I finally found a piece of land flat enough to rest above the falls, I looked around and I see something off about this laurel thicket. Limbs bent the wrong way. Leaves turned up like it was broken. I walked closer and it looked like something grayish-white hanging way up in the tree. Nub finally caught up to me, bragging over the roar of the water how he 
he is caught and released over 47 on this stream and how there ain't no trout above those falls and why do i always climb up and fish past them on dead water and he seen me standing there surprised nub stopped caught his breath and asked me why the hell i was staring at the sun i said shut up and look at that tree what is hanging from it we walked closer and it looked oddly familiar that's when i realized it was deer hair Hell, that's a deer carcass hanging up in that tree. An old one, but a carcass just the same. We couldn't figure out how it got way up there. It was close to noon, and we was a long way from the hall road. Let's eat lunch and start making our way down. I popped a can of beanie weenies and dug out a bologna sandwich, and Nub pulled out two cans of pop and handed me one. We sat thirty yards away from our conversation piece and ate lunch. After we satisfied our growling bellies, we sat and rested for a few minutes. Nub stood up to go wander off and take a piss. How you reckon that deer got up there, he said. Hell, I don't know Nub. Maybe it climbed up there and died, or something dragged. It... Up there, I stood straight up. Nub. You ever knew a bear to drag anything up a tree? Why would it? Nothing is running a bear off a whole deer on the ground. Not coyotes, not hounds, not another bear. When he turned around, I could see the fear all over him. We silently packed up lunch, broke down our poles, and commenced to get out of there as quickly and quietly as we could. We made it back to the hall road an hour before his brother was coming out and left an arrow pointing out made of sticks, so he knew we started walking out and to catch us on the way, and then it started to rain. We were halfway back to the old mill when I heard that old triaxle rumbling up the hall road. We took shelter under an overgrown iron tree beside the road, not like it mattered, and waited for him to catch up. We climbed up in the truck, stashed our gear, and told him what we saw as he drove us out. We stopped at the mill to unload, and Nub's brother told us to come on. We have to talk to someone. We told our story to an older gentleman who worked at the mill, and he drove us back down the hall road and marked that hollow with a pink ribbon. Years later, I found out that old man was a farmer, and he had been losing sheep for years, and finding them hanging in the treetops, young calves too. We had stumbled into the hollow that Cat called home. What he did to that cat, I know not. I don't want to know, but we never fished anything that ran into the elk until I got old enough to handle myself, never unarmed, and never alone. That was my first experience with big cats. My name is Lieutenant Max Phillips, but my team knows me as Phantom. I lead a squad of Navy SEALs trained to handle the most dangerous and volatile situations. We thought we'd seen it all. We were run. The call came in the middle of the night. An unknown terrorist group had seized control of a classified genetic laboratory. Their objective? Creating monstrous super soldiers with the stolen genetic tech. Our mission was to neutralize the threat and regain control of the lab. The insertion was smooth. We hit the perimeter hard and fast, gaining entry into the facility. But the interior was a nightmare. The once sterile lab was a macabre mix of high-tech equipment and monstrous creations. The super soldiers were nothing short of grotesque, a hideous blend of man and beast, each one stronger and more terrifying than the last. But we were SEALs. We adapted. We fought. As we pressed deeper into the facility, we began to uncover the horrifying truth behind the terrorist group's identity. Stashed documents, heavily encrypted files, and familiar insignias led us to an unthinkable conclusion. The group was not just any terrorists. They were a rogue unit of our own government, operating in the shadows, using American resources to create these abominations. The realization was a sucker punch, a bitter betrayal that fueled our resolve. We were fighting our own, and we had to stop them. The deeper we moved into the facility, the fiercer the resistance. Every corner held a new monstrosity, every hallway a gauntlet. 
but we pressed on, using every bit of our training and resolve to push through. We were fighting not just for ourselves, but for our country, for the world that these monsters threatened. In the heart of the lab, we found their command center, a hub of computers and machinery, and the rogue unit's leader. A face I knew. A face we all knew. He was our former commanding officer, a man we'd once trusted. His transformation into the enemy was the final, sharp sting of betrayal. The battle that ensued was a blur of gunfire, roars, and primal rage. But we prevailed, taking down the rogue unit and their monstrous creations. The aftermath was a haze. The lab was secured, the rogue unit neutralized. We had won, but the victory was bitter. We had been betrayed by our own, forced to fight against what we'd sworn to protect. As we were extracted, the facility going up in flames behind us, I looked at my team. We were bruised, battered, but unbroken. We had faced our fears, uncovered a horrifying truth, and emerged victorious. The rogue in its monstrous creations were no more, but the scars of their existence would remain with us forever. But we were seals. We would heal. We would learn. And we would be ready for whatever came next. Last summer, my boyfriend and I were camping in the Wachita Forest, off the Winona Scenic Route. We drove through a gorgeous spillway to a creek site where we had set up our camp and were laying in the hammock for the night. Next thing I know, our dog is growling this deep growl I'd never heard her make so it caught my attention. I look in the direction she's growling in and I see this weird humanoid. Figure just casually walking in the woods about 10-20 feet away from us. It's a light gray, maybe white color, seven-ish feet tall, very skinny, and has an abnormally large head. Our dog barks and catches its attention. It stops for a good 20 seconds, looks at us, then carries on its way. Needless to say, we immediately packed everything up and left. We hadn't taken anything recreational that night, though I sort of wish we had now. I truly don't know what I saw, but I'm so curious if we were the only ones to see have ever seen anything like that in that area. In 1991, I had moved to the Oxford Hills region of Maine and began exploring the forest. I would kill a day exploring. Make your way to a stream or a snowmobile trail and find your way back to civilization. One day I got into an area that was pretty far off. I had to cross a waist-deep river and a couple of small creeks before coming upon this ridge leading up to a flat-topped hill covered with tall trees. My goal was to get atop and see if I could spot a way out better than how I got in. On top the hill I saw something amongst the trees and thought my eyes were playing tricks on me. I walked right up to it. It was a 1980s school bus in pretty damn good condition. The trees boxing it in were 40 or so feet tall birch trees. There were no obvious paths it could have driven on to get there. So, seeing it was less than 10 years old, I can only assume someone stole it when it was new and maybe a path and washed out in the years since. As an ex-park ranger turned soldier, I've seen my fair share of strange and terrifying things. But nothing could have prepared me for what I encountered during my tour in Afghanistan in 2019. When we first arrived at base, it was unlike anything I had ever seen. There was nothing but a barren wasteland, and the only thing to eat was this strange, bland food that seemed to have no nutritional value. But we were soldiers, and we were used to roughing it, so we didn't think much of it. One day, while on patrol through a local town, my squad and I were ordered to investigate a strange alley that had been reported by locals. As we made our way down the narrow passage, we heard a roar unlike anything I had ever heard before. My heart was pounding in my chest as we cautiously approached the end of the alley. And then we saw it. A creature that defied description. It was a massive, hulking thing covered in thick, matted fur. It had the body of an ape but the face of something far more sinister. It let out a deafening roar and lunged at us, but we were quick to react. We unleashed a hail of bullets from our automatic rifles, and the creature fell to the ground, dead. 
As we approached the body to examine it, we were met with resistance from the locals. They were fiercely protective of the creature and wouldn't allow us to get too close. We were puzzled by their behavior, but we didn't want to cause any more trouble, so we left the creature where it lay and continued our patrol. But the memory of that creature stayed with me even after we returned to base. I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something off about it, something that didn't quite fit with what we knew about the world. I couldn't help but wonder what other strange and terrifying creatures might be lurking in the shadows of this mysterious country. As Sergeant James Odysseus Colton, leader of a Navy SEALs team, my life was defined by high-stakes missions and unimaginable pressure. But nothing could have prepared me for the horror that awaited us on a seemingly routine recovery operation in South America. Our mission was simple, recover a stolen artifact from a dangerous cartel. We infiltrated their compound, neutralized the threat, and retrieved the artifact, an ancient, green-tinted mirror with an intricate serpentine frame. Victorious, we began our return journey. It was then we realized the price of our mission. The mirror, when caught in the moonlight, awakened an ancient terror, the Gorgon. The monstrous creature, with her hair of writhing serpents and eyes that turned men to stone, emerged from the mirror's depths. Our fellow soldiers, caught by her gaze, were petrified instantly. Their screams echoed in my ears as they became stone statues. It was a sight that would haunt me forever. With our numbers dwindling, I rallied the remaining men. We face an enemy like no other, I said, my voice steady despite the terror gnawing at my insides. But we're seals. We adapt. We overcome. We fought the Gorgon with everything we had. Bullets ricocheted off her scaled body. Grenades did nothing. It was the mirror, I realized, the artifact. It was our only chance. With a daring plan in mind, I ordered my men to distract the Gorgon while I maneuvered myself behind her, the mirror clutched tightly in my hands. The Gorgon, focused on my team, didn't notice my approach. With a deep breath, I thrust the mirror in front of her. Caught in her own gaze, the Gorgon stiffened. Her serpentine hair hissed and writhed before turning rigid. In moments, she was transformed into a monstrous stone statue. Our relief was short-lived as we took in the stone forms of our comrades. The victory was bitter, our losses too great. We had defeated the Gorgon, but at what cost? The artifact, we later discovered, had been part of a dangerous gambit by the cartel to unleash chaos and seize power amidst the confusion. Their plan backfired, but it was us who paid the price. As we left the battlefield, the stone forms of our brothers in arms a stark reminder of the cost of our duty, I made a vow. We would honor our fallen, and we would continue to fight, no matter what horrors we faced. We were the SEALs, and we would never back down. Went to Table Rock View Appalachian Trail, Dauphin, Pennsylvania yesterday with some friends. We wandered a bit off the trail to look at an interestingly shaped rock in me and another friend heard what sounded like a fox, but the noises were more like how an owl woo but a bit more high-pitched. So imagine if a fox screamed but more relaxed like an owl woo and it only happened three times then stopped. One of my other friends just randomly started talking about how people who hike around the Appalachian Trail report hearing noises like children crying or a woman screaming, but it's a skinwalker trying to lure you further off the trail. I said, wait, didn't you just hear that? Kind of sounded like a high-pitched fox noise. That was when my one friend say, yeah, he heard it too, but my other friends didn't notice it. I was literally expecting to see someone, possibly younger kids, walk up the trail, but no one else ever came during that time. What do y'all think? I had always loved my job as a park ranger. I enjoyed the peace and quiet of the wilderness, the sound of the birds, and the fresh air. However, my most recent adventure in the woods had been anything but peaceful. It all started when I received a call about a group of campers who had gone missing in the woods. 
I immediately set out to search for them, knowing that the dense forest could be dangerous for those who didn't know the terrain. As I made my way through the woods, I noticed something unusual in the distance. It looked like a small town, but one that I had never seen before. I decided to investigate, hoping to find some clues as to where the missing campers might have gone. As I approached the town, I noticed that something was off. There were no signs of life, no movement, no sound. The town looked completely deserted. As I began to explore the town, I realized that it had been abandoned for years. The buildings were old and crumbling, the paint was faded, and the streets were overgrown with weeds. I wandered through the town, feeling a sense of unease. There was something about the place that made me feel like I was being watched. It was then that I heard a noise, a rustling in the bushes. I drew my weapon, ready for anything. But as I turned to face the source of the noise, I saw a group of campers emerging from the woods. Thank God we found you, one of them exclaimed. We've been lost in these woods for days. I breathed a sigh of relief, glad to have found the missing campers. But as I looked closer at their faces, I realized that something was wrong. They looked pale and frightened, as if they had seen something terrible. What happened to you? I asked. The campers hesitated before one of them spoke up. We stumbled upon this town, and we thought it was abandoned. But then we started to hear strange noises, and we saw things moving in the shadows. Something's hunting us, and it's getting closer with each passing moment. I knew that we had to leave the town immediately. We packed up our gear and set out, hoping to make it back to the safety of the park. As we made our way through the woods, I could feel the presence of something following us. It was like a predator stalking its prey, waiting for the right moment to strike. We tried to move quickly, but the woods were thick and the terrain was treacherous. We stumbled and fell, struggling to keep up our pace. And then we heard it, a growling sound that chilled us to the bone. We turned to face the noise and saw a creature emerging from the shadows. It was unlike anything I had ever seen before. It was tall and muscular, with sharp claws and teeth, and a fur-covered body that glinted in the moonlight. The campers screamed and ran in terror, but I stood my ground. I raised my weapon, aiming for the creature's heart. But as I fired, I realized that it was too late. The creature had already pounced on me, its claws tearing through my flesh. I fell to the ground, feeling my life slipping away. The last thing I heard was the screams of the campers as they fled into the night. When I woke up, I was in a hospital bed. The doctors told me that I had been found by a search party, wandering through the woods in a state of delirium. In 2002, just two weeks before Christmas, I decided to go coyote hunting by myself. I was having trouble sleeping. No one knew I had left, as it's around 11.30 p.m. no cell phones of any kind. Bad idea. I started my trek as always, down a well-used trail, until I reached a steep section covered with multiflora rose bushes. However, I had previously cut a path and it wasn't hard to navigate, even in the snow that had been falling. I continued down the hill until reaching the large ravine that sits not too far behind my house. Then moving to my left, I went about another hundred yards or so to where the terrain plains out, and you can cross a shallow stream. I crossed the stream and proceeded to walk up the long, snow-covered hillside trail. After reaching the top, I went into action setting up all of my gear and finding a spot with a good backrest and nice firing lanes. My back rested against a large pile of crushed slate. My was shotgun leveled across my knees. I quietly sat there, getting colder and colder as more snow covered by the minute. After 45 minutes to an hour I decided to quit and pack everything up. This is when things got scary. I grabbed my red filtered 1ml candle power field spotlight. When I turned it on I saw it around 10 feet away, nose to the ground in my direction on all fours. The light coming on didn't even startle or phase the creature. It's like it knew right where I was and knew the light would be on it at any second. It then took a step toward me and lifted up onto two legs. It didn't creak or crack when standing up. 
The only noise that I could note was a low, deep-sounding pop in the ribs slash sternum area. It stretched out and puffed its chest as if it wasn't big enough. I would have to say that I was at least seven, eight feet tall, with five finger hands with two inches claws. This dogman slash cryptid canine never did open its mouth, so I can't comment on teeth. It took a step toward me as I had my shotgun already leveled. I fired a shot that hit it in the right mid-upper portion of its ribs. Mind you that hitting something this close with a .12 gauge shotgun usually causes a major hole, and nothing could walk away from it. I was using number two shot and the wad would have barely opened by the time it hit the creature. The shot let loose a mist of blood in the red-tinged light of the spotting lamp. It let out a loud yelp, then tucked its ears and ran to my right. It made it out of the light circle in two strides. I fired two more times at it, but it was much too quick and I missed. I got up and started walking in the direction it ran, forgetting momentarily to reload my shotgun. I walked for about ten feet and found a large pool of blood, then walked a few more feet and found less blood. This process repeated until I was around thirty feet from where I initially started, and there's no blood to be, just footprints. It's as if this thing could quickly regenerate or something to heal itself of such a massive wound. I stopped and realized how stupid I was for going after this thing after it just got wounded. I didn't know if there may have been more of these creatures in the area or if they hunted in packs. I just thought I had encountered a real-life werewolf. I then trudged home in the night with a surely wounded God knows what potentially circling me the whole way as I go. I took my time getting back. It took me two hours to walk what normally took 20-30 minutes. I made it back home, went to bed and never spoke of that night again until 2019. I hardly hunt anymore due to health problems, but even if I was healthy, going back out there you would always be looking over your shoulder. However, I am working on getting a group of professional cryptid researchers to come take a look. I believe it was 2005. I was driving around at approximately 12.30 a.m. with three of my friends in my car. We stopped so my friend and I could relieve ourselves off of Canandaigua Road down a dirt driveway. I knew the driveway was there having seen it during the daytime. It was just a place where the town of Farmington, New York, Ontario County would dump old asphalt. I was on the driver's side of the car, my friend on the passenger side, and both of us looking in opposite directions. I saw something on the top of a small hill maybe 50 feet in front of me. I thought it was a tree initially, but it turned and started moving from my left to my right. It was very tall, at least 8 feet, maybe 10 feet. Extremely long arms that stretched down to their knees. It was gray or white in color and had somewhat of a small hit. The words that came to me were WTF is that, but before I could utter those words, my friend said, WTF is that. I turned to get back into the car which I left running but with headlights off and I saw another one in the direction he was facing. It was absolutely terrifying and if I had a gun with me, I wouldn't have done anything. But what I did was drive away as fast as possible. The other people in my car caught a glimpse of these creatures but not as well as my friend Rob and I initially, I could only assume they were aliens. They did not look like a monkey or Bigfoot or anything like that. They had no fur or hair and were skinny and just very scary looking. I assumed they were very dangerous and of all the time I've spent outdoors, in the woods, and in rural or mountainous areas, I've never seen anything like those things. After that, I hadn't seen Rob in several years as we lost contact with each other. I ran into him at a gas station about eight years later, and the first thing he said to me was, Hey, do you remember when we saw those things out in the middle of nowhere? The memory to him was just the same as mine, and upon seeing me that was the first thing that popped into his mind, and mine as well. Recently, speaking to a friend of mine who has a lot of interest in supernatural and paranormal things, I told her the story and she suggested that they were skinwalkers. She found some pictures that were animated of what they might look like. I definitely think that is what we had seen out there that night. I would absolutely love some insight into what these things are and why they may have been there. 
It does terrify me to think they had some kind of ominous purpose or could have been dangerous, but I'd still love to know. Thanks for taking the time to get back to me and read this. I will attach the picture my friend Bailey sent me, which is a very good depiction of what I saw. Also, I will send the exact location of where this encounter occurred. Thank you very much. My girlfriend and I were staying in a pop-up camper as campground hosts at Cascadia State Park in Cascadia, Oregon, about 13 miles east of Sweet Home, Oregon, during the summer of 2003. I had played some Bigfoot recordings approximately 20 minutes before getting into bed. Shortly after laying down, sound started coming from the woods directly behind the camper. It sounded like a buck snorting, but much louder. Limbs were being broken continuously. My girlfriend and I were scared and I would not get up to go and see what was going on. The sound subsided within about five minutes. One week later, I played the sounds again through my computer speakers and the same experience happened. This time it sounded as though there was a landslide as well. The next morning, one of the campers told the ranger about hearing some strange noises and something that sounded like a landslide. My girlfriend and I never smelled anything out of the ordinary. We just heard loud snorting sounds and limbs or trees being broken. Whatever it was, it sounded mad. I promise that this took place back in the summer of 2003, and I am not saying for sure it was a Bigfoot or Sasquatch. I honestly do not know what it was, but I do know that I was too scared to do any investigating at the time. My girlfriend and I went into the woods the following day, but we could not find any tracks. I grew up about 18 miles from Fat, Arkas is where a Bigfoot creature has been reportedly been seen. I am currently living in Atlanta, Texas, which is about 30 miles from Caddo Lake where you recently filmed a Mysterious Encounters episode. I just wanted to share this information about what I experienced during the summer of 2003 with you. I am a young Native American man living on a reservation. I have always felt a strong connection to the natural world, but I never imagined that my family had a secret connection to Sasquatch. It all started when my grandfather passed away and my father inherited his journal. In it, my grandfather wrote about a time when he encountered a Sasquatch deep in the forest. He described it as a peaceful creature, one that seemed to understand the connection between all living things. My father was skeptical at first, but then strange things started happening. Our family began to hear strange howls and screams coming from the forest at night, and we found footprints that were far too large to belong to any human. At first, we were afraid, but then my father remembered my grandfather's journal and began to suspect that we might have a connection to the Sasquatch. We decided to investigate further, and my father took me deep into the forest to a place that he had only visited once before. There, we found an ancient cave covered in mysterious symbols and carvings. My father explained that this was a sacred place, and that it was believed to be a portal between our world and the spirit world. As we explored the cave, we felt a strange energy around us. It was then that we heard a low growl, and we turned to see a massive Sasquatch standing before us. My father calmly spoke to the creature, explaining who we were and why we had come. To our surprise, the Sasquatch seemed to understand us, and it allowed us to leave the cave unharmed. We realized then that we had a special connection to these creatures, and that we needed to protect them from those who would seek to harm them. Since that day, we have worked to protect the Sasquatch in their habitat from those who would seek to exploit them. We have also embraced our heritage and the connection we share with all living things, and we hope to pass this knowledge on to future generations. Our connection to the Sasquatch has become a source of pride for our family, and we will continue to work to protect them for as long as we live. I should start by saying that I couldn't be sure this wasn't a bear, but it was much bigger than the other bears I've seen. I was exploring the dirt roads off of Hillockburn Road, FS Road 45 trying to find a route to Malala that was still open. 
I was riding a motorcycle KLR 650 and came upon a long straight and saw what I assumed to be a very large bear in the road. I'm an accomplished backpacker, adventure motorcyclist, and general outdoors person. I know that large bears are unusual this close to civilization, and that certainly any bears you might encounter are black bears. I'd encountered black bears several times in Oregon, while backpacking and know what they look like. My first reaction was to slam on the brakes. The thing was probably 300 yards away, but very large. As soon as I stopped, the thing stood up on two legs and walked away directly sideways off the road and into the brush. I know bears don't walk for on two legs, especially when making an escape, so that seemed out of place. I rode up to the where the thing had been and saw it had been feeding or checking out a dead deer in the road that I hadn't noticed. The odd thing is that this is in the middle of nowhere relatively speaking. I've not seen another car up here once you leave the main road. And the odds of a car or truck being up here and hitting a deer is practically zero. But the deer had been dead for some time and was black and rotting. I realized that I'm sitting next to Carrion and had just seen either a bear or something more threatening eating it and rode away quickly to continue my exploring. The only other thing to point out is that the deer wasn't there when I rode back out. This is an area that saw a lot of logging in the 70 seconds and 80 seconds, but is relatively unused now. Most roads are gated, but that doesn't stop a motorcyclist, and generally the forest is young with small sections of old growth. Where I made this sighting there was bigger trees by the side of road concealing an old logging project about 25 feet off the road. Haven't told many people about this, as I didn't want to seem crazy. I've since heard that there have been a number of sightings near Colton, which was the next closest town besides Estacada. The world had always been a place of order for me, Captain John Nighthawk Rogers, Navy SEAL team leader. That order shattered the day monstrous beasts began attacking major U.S. naval bases. My squad and I were at Norfolk Naval Base when the first attack occurred. The beast, its body a grotesque mix of scales and claws, tore through our defenses. It was unlike anything we'd ever seen, a nightmare brought to life. The coordinated attacks didn't stop there. Reports poured in from bases across the country, each detailing similar horrifying encounters. An unknown terrorist group was behind this, using the beasts as their weapons. We're SEALs, I told my squad, my voice steady despite the carnage around us. Our nation needs us. We're going to stop these beasts and bring those responsible to justice. Our mission had two parts, neutralize the threats and discover their origin. We dispatched teams to each affected base, while a group of us, including myself, started investigating the monsters. Battles raged across the country as we tried to neutralize the monstrous threats. The beasts were tough, with skin that deflected bullets and strength that outmatched our best trained soldiers. But we were SEALs, we adapted, we overcame. Meanwhile, our investigation led us to a chilling discovery. These weren't natural creatures, they were bioengineered, a perversion of nature created in a lab. Piecing together intelligence, we located the terrorist group's headquarters, a compound hidden deep in the mountains. As we infiltrated, we discovered the horrifying truth. The terrorists had found a way to control the monsters, using them as pawns in their twisted game. With this knowledge, we devised a daring plan to sever the control the terrorists had over the beasts. A fierce battle ensued, the echoes of gunfire and roars of monsters filling the night air. It was chaos, but in the chaos, we found our opportunity. We severed the control link causing the beasts to become disoriented and giving us the upper hand. The battle was won, but the war was far from over. The terrorists were unmasked, their monstrous weapons neutralized, but the scars they left were deep. As we stood amidst the rubble of what was once a symbol of our nation's strength, we knew our job was only just beginning. The world was a different place now, a place where monsters could be real. But as long as there were threats to our nation, there would be people ready to stand against them. We were the Navy SEALs, and we would face whatever came next.
When I was around 17, 18, I'm now 23, probably about a year or so before I had symptoms show up. I worked at a cinema which is notoriously haunted. People quit their jobs from seeing things. Multiple people I know claim to have heard unexplainable voices, laughs, cries, doors locking, being knocked on when no one's around, that sort of thing. I was working on the food counter and a guy in a wheelchair came in and said look after your body kid in an extremely haunting fashion. Me being an immature drug enthusiast laughed it off and he'll never forget the look he gave me when I giggled at what he said. It's almost like I can still see his face and hear how he said it. I've had sleep paralysis with the guy's face staring back at me, creepy yes. But the funny thing is shortly after this is when I started experiencing crazy health symptoms. Loss of control over my bowels, bladder, pain in legs, arms, etc. I clearly didn't listen to his advice, smoking, drinking, doing pills, sniffing anything that can be sniffed, basically just abusing my body to a high extent. I can't help but think this guy was some kind of messenger, something warning me about the path I was about to go down. So fast forward to today, I'm not well at all and it all feels like I've just ignored the signs that were put before me. I've never really been to into the whole God stuff, but I've always left a space for the thought of something bigger than me. But recently I've started praying before I go to sleep, just asking for insurance with my health, etc. Hoping for the best kind of thing. I've always had an overactive imagination. I used to think I could astral project and always had crazy lucid dreams. But in the past few days I feel like when I close my eyes all I can see is crazy dark shit almost like demons and dark shit going on. But last night, I had these visions where two people were dressed in like robes and one of them offered me a hand, which I took. One of them then continued to dig into my chest and seemingly remove the pain in my chest, and then held their hand up almost bringing attention to their five fingers. I don't know what this means and it kinda scares me as to what it could. I guess what I'm here saying is, you guys just think I'm nuts anyone had any similar risk going on in their life? Is it time to fully accept God into my life? F knows, let me know what you think. My son and I were in the Detroit area in the fall of 2000 October. We heard what we thought was a high-pitched scream coming out of the creek bottom. We heard the sound twice, once very close just about 300 yard downhill from us. Then again from farther off and to the right in an area of big timber. The sound left an impression on the two of us. We have hunted and fished all over Oregon but the sound is like nothing I have ever in my life. Heard. It was as if you could hear it in your head after the sound had stopped. The area is southwest of Detroit on the south shore would very much like to hear other recorded sounds but little unsure. Maybe a little freaky hearing the same sound recorded by other people. Have been interested in Bigfoot since was a kid but the sound we heard is like nothing we've ever heard. I am living very rural, in a small village with maybe 10 minus 15 houses, but close to the highway you can drive there within maybe 5 minutes, and also about 10 minutes away from the town. If you cross the street, it just takes you about 10 minute walk to reach the forest. First Christmas Day. In the afternoon, my partner and I decided to go for a little digestive walk, as we were really stuffed from all the food. It was about 17 and already dark when we left and we had a big and bright LED flashlight with us. I also took my camera and my flash, as I love taking pictures of nature at night. We decided to walk on a little country road towards the forest, and then turn right, following a small graveled cycle track close to the forest border, which connects our village in the next maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes walk between villages. In the middle part of the track, you have to walk through a small bit of forest. It's rather dark and the trees are very high and quite dense. When we entered, I saw our flashlight reflecting on something and recognized a car being parked there on the side of the track, close to the trees. This struck me as odd, as cars are not allowed to drive there, and the path is very narrow and hidden, so I was a bit cautious. My partner pointed the light inside of the car and it seemed to be empty. 
I also noticed the windows were frozen, so it must have been parking there for a while. A bit in front of the car I spotted a tree with an intriguing structure, and I asked my partner to point the flashlight towards it, so I could focus better and photograph it with my flash. After I took a few images, my partner told me, Um, there is someone standing behind us in the middle of the road. He is looking at us. Nobody was following us the whole way. I kept looking around and behind us occasionally, because at this time in the evening and close to the border of the forest there are boars sometimes in its mating season, so they are more aggressive than usual. Indeed there was a man standing behind us, staying out of the flashlight's reach. He wasn't saying anything, just standing there and facing us. At first, I thought he might be startled, as it may seem a bit weird if someone's just taking photos around your car it was not even legal to drive on that path with the car. I decided to get up and confront him from a distance, explaining to him that I was just taking photos of that tree. He didn't react and still just stood there. I then went on to ask him if he needed some light, and he replied that this wasn't necessary. It was odd, but I was still calm, sure about there being a normal explanation for his behavior. Nonetheless, my partner and I decided to just get the F out and followed the path leading to the next village. It was maybe five to seven minutes until we reached it. I remembered the letters on his license plate, not the numbers though, unfortunately, and googled it, and it turned out that he was from a city about six H away from our village. Mind you, the country I live in is in a very strict lockdown right now, so you are only allowed to travel even by car if you have very urgent reasons. After we reached the first lantern of the next village, we looked back and observed the car driving a bit out of the forest, turning around, and going back inside. I was able to see that he parked there again and turned the lights off, he didn't leave the forest. We then went home on a much longer way than initially intended, as I didn't want to go back there for obvious reasons. Our flashlight battery died on the way, and my phone battery was low, so I didn't want to call the police back then. But I called them as soon as I arrived home and gave them all the details big regret that I didn't memorize the whole license plate. But it was just so surprising that I seriously didn't think about it. Also, it only occurred to me as really strange when I thought about the frozen windows and that he could impossibly have walked behind us, plus him having no light and not responding. He did seem to be sneaking up on us when I sat down to take the photo. I think I was very lucky to have my partner, the camera, in the bright light with me. I don't want to imagine what could have happened if I was alone. So, creepy guy sneaking around in the forest, let's not meet. Edit. When I told my housemate, she theorized that he may have been spying on the houses very close to the forest border. As you can easily look into their backyards without being seen, you have to walk a bit up the hill. And further, about five minutes. I think it's likely. I had the thought of photographing the car when I entered the forest part of the path, but somehow I felt unwell about it and decided to not do it, despite it being an interesting scene. In hindsight, I believe this saved me as he must have hidden behind the trees close to the car and forest entrance. If he was really planning a burglary or worse dumping a body, I think it's not unlikely he may have attacked me if he realized I had a potential photo of his car with a recognizable license plate. This is a Bigfoot encounter told to me by my grandfather. It happened in the early fall of 1938. He and his friends did a backpacking trip to a small remote lake near Mount St. Helens. They did this annually. One year they even summited the volcano during their yearly camping trip. This particular year there were five of them. The hike in took a couple of days back then. There weren't as many dirt roads built as there are now. They chose late summer and early fall when the berries were in season and the fish were usually biting well because they did not want to pack much food. It helped to lighten the load of their heavy backpacks. My grandfather was a little over 20 years old during this backpacking trip. After the two-day hike to the lake, they set up camp and decided the next morning that my grandfather and another guy would try to catch some fish. The other three young men would go collect berries. The next morning they did just that. My grandfather walked to the far side of the lake and his friend was on the side nearer to camp. 
The fish were biting, and he had caught a few when all of a sudden he started to feel uneasy as if he were being watched. The hair on the back of his neck seemed to stand on end, and then he got a whiff of a foul-rotting stench. He started to look around, and directly behind him, only twenty to thirty feet away, were three giant human-like creatures covered in dark brown hair from head to toe standing at the tree line. My grandfather was a large man around six feet four, and the smallest of the three creatures was just as tall as him. However, it was much wider at the shoulders and much thicker. According to what he was looking at, the next creature was a foot taller, and then the third was even a foot taller than that one, putting each of them at six feet or better. The next one was over seven feet, and the other one was over eight feet tall. He was overwhelmed with adrenaline from fear and panic. He wanted to run, however, these three giants staring at him were blocking the only direction that he could run. The only way he could get away would be to leap into the lake and swim. He decided his best option was to calm down and keep doing what he was doing. He cast in his line and began to fish again. Shortly after that, he caught another nice trout, and while reeling it in it dawned on him that these creatures may be here for his fish. He unhooked the trout and tossed it to them. The smallest of the three stepped away from the tree line and retrieved the trout and brought it back to the other two. So he continued to toss fish to them. The smaller the three Bigfoot continued to retrieve the trout. After a while, he landed a really nice fourth trout. He went to toss it back to them, but they were gone. He then grabbed his equipment and ran around the lake in the direction of the other friend. After finding him, he said that they need to get the hell out of there and began to tell him what happened as they headed back to camp. When they got to camp, the other friends were already there picking up camp gear, and in a hurry. They stated that they ran across three giant hairy creatures while out berry hunting. It took the group only a day to hike back out downhill. They did not know what they had encountered. They had never heard of anything like that in the 1930s since the term Bigfoot had not been known. After the trip, they never went back to Mount St. Helens. They changed the location of their yearly backpacking trip. My grandfather stated it wasn't until the 1967 Patterson or Gimlin Bigfoot film was shown in theaters across the nation that he finally had a name for the three giant creatures he had a close encounter with. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.